All right. Hold on. Here comes the real mic. Oh, you feeling the real mic? That's a real oh, yeah. fucking mic. I can feel that. That high. You feel that shit? You know what this mic comes from? This mic was stolen from Teen People in 2003. <laughs> shit, dude. I had a stolen mic stand from a like local high school party. DJ said he just left one. I just yeah, took no. it. This is fucking Time Inc. money. AKG. Fucking. This is oh, the level shit. set for all fucking interviews ever. What's up? No, oh, not much. I got. I got. I got. I, I, I got to record this in fucking GarageBand in case you fuck up and dump the audio, so you have something to work with. <laughs> dump. I don't trust That's you guys, it. man. I mean, we already had this bad fucking jiggy thing five years ago. I can't trust it. You know. It, uh, it's insane that it was five years ago because I just don't think of it that long ago. Isn't that crazy? Like the internet just doesn't let time fucking happen. It's just it shit doesn't. never ends. It really doesn't. Shit is so much shit has happened between five years ago in general. Just the music landscape has changed so much. Like when well, we talked last, Spotify yeah. was barely a thing. It was barely. Oh, well, it was a thing in Europe though. But I know what you're yeah. saying. Like the the streaming fucking you. the streaming advertising promo fucking bot shit bullshit. Like it, it's just it, it's it's hit the point where it's like it's overtaken everything and like. I never complained about the fucking, you know, categorization, feeding you shit, you know, stuff that I've been complaining about since I came back. Back in the day, I was like, okay, you're saying you're independent, but you're taking advertising money from Lexus and all this bullshit. And like, Mm -hmm. that's fucking hypocritical as hell. And it drives me crazy. And you all like, you all ghost the second anyone asks you a question about this. You fucking ghost and you keep putting out posts about this great new band that I like and I really just like this band. And they were just fucking hiding behind this positivism when in reality they were all fucking doing coke and drugs and fucking crazy shit that was so much fucking worse like than people ever knew about. And they, they still don't know about it. It so it just like, pissed, uh, it just pissed me off, and I and like the thing that sucked is it's not like anybody involved in that was going to be like, yeah, he's right. I'm going to help him back up his fucking story. He's <laughs> burning us down. Like that shit wasn't going to happen. So I was on my own and whatever. And then, you know, I got people. I had people fucking crusading against me and fucking taking the littlest thing and just being like, that guy is a fucking piece of shit. Because yeah, you know, you get an in to to invalidate someone who's talking shit about you you're gonna fucking take that and work it for all you can and they did and that's case, fine case in point that fader article that fantano got yeah, oh, yeah. so i worked uh, actually um so yeah that was pretty crazy um yeah so l- like look i can't like <laughs> so anthony and i are friends um mm-hmm. we've we're, we're sort of like lifeline buddies like we call each other when we're like up against some shit mm-hmm. um and you know through that process the I was offline when this all happened. Mm-hmm. Now I was offline, but I wasn't offline to Anthony. And so, you know, I had a lot of exposure to what he was going through and how hard this was for him emotionally, you know, not legally. No, um, I understand. That that it's a it's an attack on his character as a person. It's someone who he's not. That it's just it was a complete call out for no explicit reason other than because the, the journalists want to be gatekeepers still and he's kind of breaking down that wall. Well, this little kid wanted to make his name on Dragon Anthony Fantano and be like, yo, you don't realize this, but he's got this other channel where he's putting 4chan memes and shit. Like, I was just like, <laughs> dude, you are so fucking 22. Will you shut the fuck up? But the thing that killed me is like, or not killed me, the thing I loved about this whole process, and I wasn't around, I wasn't watching any of this. I was totally fucking offline. But, you know, I've since, go- I've since gone back and I've looked at it, and I'm like, at no point, as much shit as people give Anthony Fantano and they love to fucking clown on him and he sets himself up to get clowned on and he knows that at no point did this guy go my wife's black he never played that <laughs> yeah, fucking exactly. card exactly. and that is like that I, and I, That's I had like a fucking part of two it. hour I had a two hour conversation with him where I was like I can't it's so hard to reconcile how fucking stand up and collected and composed he was around all this bullshit with the same cheap ass cards he could have dropped on the table Mm -hmm. and been like, yeah, peace. Mm -hmm. He never did that. He just sat back. And I mean, it was just, it it was totally like, he's not that much younger than me. I mean, a bit, but I was like, I could never have handled this with the fucking grace that you did. I could never have done it. I would have blown myself up eight times, you know? So yeah, it, it was really fucked up. And 
you know, I think, look, that th this is the whole thing I've also been talking about. Like, this matters to five people. This whole thing is so much smaller than people realize because of bots and fucking all the media publications by bots. It's all fucking juiced bullshit, you know, aggregation, correlation. They're all fucking gaming the system. Like, once Spotify is over, and Twitter is now finally getting a rebound problem where advertisers are like, this is all actual bullshit and we're getting nothing for our money. And so I think the fact that this whole bot inflation, um, you know, amping, amplifying what's going on to an unrealistic, totally phony degree has gotten so obvious and egregious that everyone is like, it's all kind of fucked up and bad and fake. And, and like, you don't want to, you don't want to trash me too. Cause me too is super fucking important. Like mm -hmm. companies, in England are, companies in England are paying women 50% of what they're paying men. That's fucking wrong as shit. So it, it's fucking it's off. No, the Me Too thing. Having worked in Hollywood, having even just in the teen sense of it, I was a child I was in the child act area. Having grown up around that and seen the way that young girls get treated, and I worked were were basically we were going into being Disney sitcom stars, which is where Dan Schneider sat at, which is where you know I saw people like Dan Schneider yeah. at these auditions, and you see the way teen girls get eyed at more than teen boys, and it's 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 creepy and it's real it's a constant thing in hollywood it's just been buried since the 70s yeah but it's the same in finance and all these other industries the thing Absolutely. that's for me is like look i spent fucking years railing against what i felt was hypocrisy in the music industry because i love music and i was a punk rock kid and i was actual fucking diy and some of these people were too but the problem was like, dude, you're taking fucking money from Top Man and Lexus and all this shit and Miller Coors. And like, it's obviously swaying your coverage and it's bullshit and you don't own up to it. But the problem was right up to the point that I was getting my loudest with this. All this other shit came out, you know, like the PR company that was very loudly and famously outed for having a drug addicted sexist misogynist piece of shit on top of it who was dealing drugs to the people who were in charge of some of these websites i'm not going to get into names but it was in a public record that zach from dive and sky ferrera got arrested for bringing drugs into the country they were doing that for this pr company and for this website people think they don't understand how bad the drug use was like if you if i told you the stories you'd be like and I said it was about Vice. You'd be like, yeah, of course. Orgies everywhere, you know, doing coke off, you know, 19-year-old girls' tits. That's, that's Vice, man. That's what they do. It wasn't just Vice. No, I don't and, doubt it that. And so some, you know, so some of these people got away with it. And they're going to get away with it. And they're not the Harvey Weinsteins. They're not people who should go to jail for the rest of their life. They're not. They no. were insecure fucking losers who loved and lived with music and then got into a position of power. And if you're a person who grew up with music and love music, man, fucking outsized drug use is about fucking one tick on the dial. Once you have the ability to do it, that's what you've been told to do the whole time. So I don't blame these people and I'm not naming names and I'm not coming back to fuck people up anymore. I'm done with that shit. That's exactly um, the reason why my dad left the industry in, in general because he wasn't going to patsy the drug mule for everyone in the studio. He worked at A and M in the seventies in L A. Oh boy, that's but fucking fistfuls of coke, baby. That's he, fucking. He was max absolutely status. asked by Mick Jagger's personal assistant, Karen Carpenter, and the Stranglers to go find prostitutes, drugs, and he's just like, "I'm the studio tech. I'm not in charge of this shit." And his yep. boss comes up to him and goes, "No, no, you do that for him. I'll cover your job." And he just couldn't stand doing that every you know every time they did that. Yeah, and it it's just a thing of you're you're trying to do one thing that's a very small thing. And that's what I was doing. And it's not like I blew up. <laughs> My main goal is to blow up and then act like I don't know nobody. But it's like <laughs> it wasn't like that. And it never had that audience. And I knew that. It was never going to. But when you chafe people like that, when you get right up in people's shit. With, with back channel stuff that I'm getting told by disgruntled employees, it fucks the mix up bad. And those people will do fucked up shit to try and shout you down. And mm -hmm. they did that to me. And, um, you know, you know, full fucking disclosure, like there's some stuff I did that was pretty fucking stupid. You know, right. fucking, yeah, straight up. I sent fucking drunk, stupid, thirsty DMs to a couple people. And yeah. uh, that shit happened. 
and I yeah. fucking own that, you know, like fine. Okay. <laughs> like that's, that's fucking stupid, but it's not like, I just, you know, th- this whole like ability to shout down people with magic words, like toxic slid into DMS, uh, mm-hmm. this, that, and the other, you know, like, it's just this fucking like invalidation routine. That's always gone on when you have a contrarian position. Um, it just got really fucking weird and bad for me to a point where like somebody who's on MTV has their Facebook page named after me and is like bullying people into talking shit about me. Like Mm. it got really fucked up. And, um, and like the shit with this, there's a musician that I got in a stupid one fucking Twitter exchange with who then put that up on a fucking billboard with no context and was like, this person is X, Y, and Z. And I was just like, fuck, man, there's an, as much as there could be an audience for the type of things that I've said and continue to say, there's just as much of an audience for the people who want to support these other people and just fucking shout you down. And that's fine. They have, they they can do that. And I earned it. You know, I fucking stood up. I got up and I was like, hit me with a baseball bat. And they fucking hit me with a baseball bat. And I was like, I have a real life and I don't need this shit. And Trump just got elected and all these people that I've known for years and years are now spouting all this insanely fucking melodramatic bullshit about politics. Like, dude, I followed you because you had good taste in music. You're not the person I'm looking to, to explain American politics to me. I got it. And it's just, (laughs) it it just got to the point where I was like, I gotta, I gotta fucking go. Like, I gotta go. I didn't do anything. I'm not Louis CK. You know, I don't need to go because I need to go. I need to go because I need to go. And I took about a year and a half off and I got perspective, you know, I was like, yeah, I did what I did. What the fuck ever. Nobody gives a shit, you know, and there's nothing I'm going to fucking hang for. But, um, it was so small and it got turned into such a fucking like sledge for anybody who wanted to fucking wash me that I was like, okay, well it's actually nothing. So I don't give a shit if I come back for that. And then it was also a thing of like, okay, yeah, I'm over 40, but I'm not dead. And I'm not going to come back and be like, let me explain Grimes to you guys. Like, I'm not going to come back and be like, <laughs> look, guys, I don't think you guys really understand Cardi B. You need this white, <laughs> this white 41 year old guy. Cause I made a joke a long time ago where I was like, no 40 year old white man should have an opinion about Lady Sovereign. And I, and I knew when I wrote it, I was like, <laughs> I'm going to be that guy and it's going to be Cardi B, Cardi B or whatever it is. And I shouldn't have an opinion about that. And now I know that. And it's like, like, I don't, I'm not like, you want to ask me my opinion about like pop music. My fucking kids are listening to, <laughs> I'm not yeah. going to offer it, man. It's for my kids. It's for fucking 22 year olds. It's not for me. I'm not even going to go there. Bruno Mars album though. Oh, it's miserable. Like I didn't look, <laughs> dude, like this is my whole thing. I'm like, I'm here. If you want to ask me a question, right? I'm not here to fucking slam on shit. That's going on for kids today. <laughs> and my whole thing, this, this swing around is like kids today are getting fucking killed by people my age who are trying to hang on to fucking bullshit media jobs and, and tell kids what's what, but their fucking, their whole agenda is help streaming, help fucking metadata, help fucking look. Cause lazy is the best open in the business. If you have something that can help people be lazier you're going to fucking knock it out of the park every time. And that's what Spotify is. Oh, exactly. That's what it felt like with, uh, I remember they were talking about like uh, with iTunes, when iTunes first started up, just the whole concept that you didn't have to go to the store to buy your singles anymore. You didn't have to buy the album anymore. You could just listen to the hits you wanted to listen to. And that scared people so much back then. Yeah. But it also became their whole rallying cry when they got Ian and the fucking, you know, Ivy got in and all these people and yeah. fucking pinch Scott Plagan from Pitchfork and like, well, you we can sell Pitchfork's name along with the launch of Apple Music, baby. Their whole thing, they kept talking about it and I wrote a, a Medium post about it. You need curation. You need trusted curation. How can you live without <laughs> trusted curation in your life? And like, all they're selling you on is let us manipulate the definition of cool. That's all yeah. it is. Feist, one, two, three, four. Coolest song of the, of the decade. It's just fucked up, man, because the fucking like when I did that first video, when I came back and I posted the numbers, like it was there's just like 15 bands I screen capped on this and they have like 40,000 plays and like 10,000 of those are me. <laughs> like 10,000 of the plays on seems the problem with me are me. 
Literally, me. I'm surprised the Rodan one doesn't have more, but that's just because I know of that like circle of you know uh, de- virtual crate digging that uh, goes with the indie rock, math rock scene at that time. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, like I said in the video, man, like nobody's keeping this shit alive because it's not working for anybody. You want to work? No. Get synced up to fucking Stranger Things, man. Put fucking the everyday world of bodies in the next fucking episode oh, yeah. of Stranger Things. Eight million plays, dude. Like, good to go. Dude, I'm waiting for that Fugazi in the next step in the next season. Don't you know why the fuck did they do a video about In on the Kill Taker, their fucking shittiest album? Like <laughs> Facet Squared is the only good song on that fucking record. Like Margin Walker was the shit. Like, oh, it's just ugh. It, the it, whole it's like, the lack of attention towards Red Medicine in general. Oh, don't go. I don't like that shit, man. You're talking I like, like that one. The I'm Red Medicine, the Red Medicine argument period is where I was like, oh yeah, you guys are Bruce Springsteen, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they got bought into come so back? hard. There were so many kids that were like, "I was only thir- I was only thirteen when thirteen songs came out, so I can't like that. I don't know that, but then I know Fugazi is supposed to be great. So, yeah, Red I, Medicine. I I mean, it's okay, whatever, dude. Like for me, Fugazi is an '80s thing. It's not a '90s thing. Fugazi in the '90s sucked. They're an '80s band. They were important in the '80s. They were a transitional band that helped us get out of, you know, bullshit hardcore you know, roughneck nonsense. Like oh, yeah. they expanded all that. And so did the other, you know, side projects they had, you know, like, I mean, uh, one last wish is like the best fucking shit ever, you know, like, is that what it's called? Fuck. I'm trying to think of what you're thinking of either. But I'm not sure. I, I was super the, the, into the my that, in high school and I like, I followed the Ian Mackay timeline basically. No, but he's and that's like, where I got to Fid- Fugazi. Yeah, no, there's the, there's the weird obscure record that never got released. I think it's one last wish. It sounds exactly like the cure. Um, and it's, it's, you know, whatever, like I had a friend who had it and I was like, holy shit, like, this is the good stuff. Like there was that band three too. Like I'd mentioned that in the podcast, like there were lots of bands underneath punk that were like, I sort of like the cure and mission of Burma and I'm sick of playing fast. And the big one obviously is Dag Nasty because Dag Nasty is the bridge, they're the bridge out of all this. I mean, can I say it's fucking flawless? Like, I mean, circle, like all the fucking uh, I mean, it was just so perfect because it was so much better than like, you know, fucking judge. I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of like, I have a very long history of just uh, crate, just again, virtual crate digging through punk records in high school because I just had a lot of free time and the internet was a treasure trove. Of wait, wait, you had, the, the time. You, had, you had the internet in high school? Yes, yeah, so I'm only 25. Jesus <laughs> Christ, man, you were 20 the last time we talked? Fuck me. Yeah, essentially. So, I, I mean, 20. for me, it was crazy enough having the internet in college. We didn't, even yeah. have mu- we didn't even have music over the internet. It was impossible. You had a fucking, the only file type that could play audio was dot .move, fucking QuickTime. I, I've been on eight the hours music to load. scene. I don't know, the internet music scene since Napster, basically, and the original SoulSeek. Like I, I had older siblings. Like, yeah, do you have DC plus plus? You got that shit? I think I did. That sounds did, really were familiar. You on, were you on Audio Galaxy? I wasn't on it. I was eight years old, man. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go. I gotta go. I, I, ha- I had I'm it too, on the old. computer. I had yeah, it on the Windows ninety five. <laughs> I had ninety eight. I had fucking ninety eight. I had uh, ninety eight SE two, baby. No, audio. Seriously though, if you want to talk about early days, Audio Galaxy was the best thing that ever happened. It was a totally straight up open channel agent on everyone's machine, and you got your own landing page for your profile, and you would upload MP3s that really were links to the file on your actual computer. Oh my like, god, that's like crazy, a Josie's thing. Crazy insecure, <laughs> like totally fucking like Wild West shit. But oh, within man. months, in two thousand one, I think it was. I was living in. It was. Yeah, it was right after 9-11. I was living in St. Mary's around the corner from Fenway Park with my buddies. And Audio Galaxy went fucking crazy for like nine months to a year. And like, you would get shit that was like somebody made an MP3 off a tape. Like, and now it's like, okay, fine. It's on SoundCloud. There's a fucking 900,000 UK rave bootleg fucking mixes from 91, you know, all categorized and perfect. And it's all there. But the thing with Audio Galaxy is it has the it had the metadata of recommendation, and that's what we're losing because Spotify and Apple Music are defining how mm-hmm. you hear about shit. They're saying this means this. You listen to this, this equals this in our cloud of metadata bullshit that they again bought from Echo Nest and outside Mass- outside Boston. Audio Galaxy was like you find a person who likes this and you trust them and you follow them the way you follow somebody on Twitter. Yeah. 
and you get fucking crazy rare shit that they've only uploaded because they know you can't find it. And yeah. it was just like, you know, the, whatever what CD meant to people, it was like that, but easier and, and more casual. Yes. And what CD, what CD was so fucking time consuming that I just couldn't <sighs> even do it. Well, it sounds like um, what SoulSeek is now, which is, it's no longer just people uploading their shit anymore, which is what I remember it being. I remember it being where like you could find the Autek or DJ set from last week or some shit. That's what I remember it being. And, SoulSeek? Yeah. That's what I remember oh, SoulSeek being. SoulSeek for me was just like waiting hours and hours for yes. fucking weird remixes to download and just going to bed with your 56k modem yeah dude you gotta set that shit overnight <laughs> oh for real i mean i had a fucking compact d pen baby at that point Ooh. and i think i had a us robotics 56k um so yeah, now this know, is, is very much a people have their library on display and you basically some of them have their shit organized in their folder so you can browse their own folders on their on their thing and just find genres or whatever the hell they want. Well, to. that was the that was the beauty of DC plus plus that one I mentioned is, is that it gave you a virtual file system into somebody's computer so you could browse it before you start hooking into downloading and like select. I want this fucking cure bootleg from this guy and I'm going to bed. Um, yeah, you know, it's just the whole myth of the social aspect of Spotify and Apple music is just getting more and more transparently false and they're pushing and they're pushing, and, you know, there've been plenty of articles written about the fucking, you know, playola playlist, Ola and, and how, you know, rap caviar and all this bullshit is fucking stuff up so fucking hard. And it's just, it sucks. And it, and Lil pump is the fucking, that's it. <laughs> Little punk getting fucking eight million dollars from Warner Brothers? Are you fucking kidding me? Are this we back to the eighties? I can't say. <laughs> I'm gonna get fucking dragged on. Fucking oh, we're gonna we'll bleep it out. Don't worry. We can say. You can say. Yeah, everything good. Here. That's a really fucking socially unconscious word to use. Uh, I mean, it's come back no, around it's... a lot due to edgy YouTubers. Surprisingly, you'd be surprised how many people our age really say again, but not necessarily at people. They say as in like a descriptor again. Well, it was a fucking word that meant something before it ascribed a human condition. Of course. I mean, it's fucking stupid. People are so... It sucks, Lexicon dude. changes, it's, though. It just sucks, man. It sucks hearing all this histrionic bullshit that fucking children are spouting on Twitter. They have no fucking idea what they're saying. It is children, though. That's the weirdest part. It is children. It's literally 13-year-olds. It's like, at 13, I thought I knew what was socially cool and socially acceptable and what was progressive and things like that. And it just turns out you're just repeating bullshit passed down to you by, like, an older sibling or some shit. Dude, when I was 13, Ronald Reagan was president, okay? Yeah. Like, and, I, and the day that Trump got elected, before I quit Twitter, the first thing I said was, we survived eight years of Ronald Reagan with no access to information at all. Mm -hmm. We had no idea what any, anyone was doing. Donald Trump can't even wake up without getting shithoused by <laughs> a very loud, very powerful oppositional media. Yep. That is good. That is good stuff. No, it's man. much better than what it was with the Bush and Reagan era. It absolutely is. And 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 like like value that shit. Don't keep bitching about how you're not getting what you want. I mean, like, so look, I did a fucking interview um, with some other radio station. I think it was Connecticut College. I guess the audio got fucked up. But what I said in this was like, I can't believe that politicians in this country have not figured out give everybody what they want. Every little thing they want oh it is God. so small. It is the smallest thing. Legalize I, I... everything. It doesn't affect <laughs> anyone. It doesn't matter. It's a tiny little fucking loud audience of people who just want to be fucking accepted. Just let it go. Because they're using it as a way to not talk about real fucking issues that yeah. by number actually matter. They can just focus on – they've done this forever. But now with social media and all this shit and all this power, we're still getting gamed by this system and letting them talk about tiny identity politics. It's, it's identity just, identity yeah, politics. It's identity politics, which, which, which shouldn't even, I mean, like you have your voice, man. You can say whatever you want. Mm -hmm. No one's shutting that down. No. Like just give them what they want and they can't complain anymore. I can't. I can't tell you how many times every Twitter I see there's somebody. Somebody, you know, it's a, I want to promote my my black voice on Twitter, and there's a bunch of black people on Twitter promoting that back. It is it, you are never not in the limelight when you want to be. With, well, wait, like, hold social on. Media. Um, all right. So wait. Uh, one of one of I'm talking to two people, right? Yeah. 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 All right, one of you. One of you is black African American, right? Yeah. Yes. Just say black. 
Well, I'm not doing. I'm not doing the fucking my He's one Canadian black friend. American. I'm not doing my <laughs> one black friend thing here. I got one black friend, so I can say whatever I want. No, yeah. it's not that. It's just these are important things, and they're not getting corrected. And I'm just mm-hmm. saying, all you have to do is just fix it. Just let it go. Give them everything yeah, they yeah. want. It's just like, look, dude, this is corny as shit. But like Chris Rock had a routine where he's like, there's black people in five places. You know, like this, this country is fucking mad ghettoized racially. It always has been like, it's just by number. It's not a big deal. Hear these voices, give them what they're fucking asking for. Mm-hmm. And it, and it stops. Especially with they don't, what they don't, they don't want to do it. They don't want to do it yeah. because they can't keep using that wedge to distract you from, I mean, we're, we're getting into a totally fucking stupid place, but it just, the, the Trump thing was a big fucking problem for me because what am I going to say? I'm going to get into politics. Yeah. No, I don't want to. And you look at, <laughs> Fant- we talked, we opened up talking about Fantano. Mm-hmm. Fantano was like doing this stuff, reaction vids to political issues. Yeah. And his pe- sarcastic ones, people in his life were like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Stay in your fucking lane. Talk about music. Talk to kids about music. Shut the fuck up about politics because you're just asking to get fucking run over by a Mack truck. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's what happened. They went after that those receipts and they uh tried to misrepresent them. Well, look, man, I'm not look, some of the stuff on that fucking other channel was weird. And he got fucked over because he got a guy in early before he came out and was like a mad fucking racist piece of shit. Yeah, well, Sam. Because- we talked about Sam Hyde before, uh, like two weeks before that happened. It yeah. was really yeah. interesting. Well, it's like, look, you can get fucking dragged, and I made this joke right about when I came back. I'm gonna go drag you for a record review you wrote 15 years ago. Really? For fucking real? You're gonna tell me a record review that ran in the New York Times in 20 in 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 2003 about Liz Fair means culture is bad? Are you are you fucking kidding me? Like that's fifteen fucking years ago, man. Yeah, I guess their edit sucked and wasn't politically correct then. But like, we're gonna make this a thing now, and it's gonna be a rallying cry. Like, okay, if somebody writes a really shitty misogynist fucking review of Saint Vincent tomorrow, yeah, they deserve to get their fucking ass burnt out because that's just not acceptable anymore. There's a lot of policing around messaging now, and there should be. 2003 man rolling stone and spin barely had websites in 2003 barely mm-hmm. they didn't want to put their content out on the web because they were giving it away yeah so like the web was just a fucking free-for-all of dumbass 23 year old fuckheads like me like we wrote shit that was like super personal and when you're 23 your personal politics suck you're a fucking <laughs> idiot you don't know anything you look at somebody who's sexually attractive and you're like talking about them in those terms because that's what's fucking resonating for you because you're a fucking horny dipshit 23 year old kid like one of the big names in this jess hopper right back when she was doing hit it or quit it with chris ryan who's now like the second lieutenant for simmons and the ringer and all this bullshit these people were they had a zine and and i you know had a brief entanglement with them and we had this argument about mary timoney from helium and i was like she's kind of like struggling and it's not going well blah 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 and we had this conversation about the fact that i was like she's straight up selling her sexuality in all of her songs in these first records pirate prude and whatever and um i was like she's free to do that and that's great Robert Smith was free to sell it. George Michael was free to sell his sexuality. You know, all these people, they, they do it. And she kind of did it. And we got in these arguments about it. And I was just like, look, man, they put it on the fucking table, you know? Um, and it's just, it's just gotten so different, man. Like everybody used to have their say and walk away and think about it and be like, okay, this part of what I thought was wrong. I was wrong. I need to like mature. And think differently about these particular issues. But now it's just like fucking sledgehammers. Like how can kids grow up in this environment? How can they grow up? How can you learn? All you're getting told is you're invalid. You're wrong. You're a misogynist. You're, uh, you're fucking transphobic. Whatever. Like you say one wrong thing at 19. 
and you're a fucking pariah dragged across the whole fucking fabric of whatever you know it's just this is different and fucked up and it sucks for kids and i'm i'm like it's such a cheap fucking flag to fly to be like oh i'm i'm here for the kids I'm, I'm here for the kids man i'm all about the kids no i'm not here for the you kids you see this sort of attitude is like pervasive throughout it throughout the entirety of american culture i i feel like it's still sort of just an internet thing to be honest well no so i took a year and a half off and i can tell you for real nobody gives a fuck about any of the shit music twitter's talking about <laughs> get a shit man. <laughs> You're, you don't no, even people are screaming in the streets so. the gas lamp killer deserves to die yeah, yeah. like you got nineteen thousand fake yeah. followers on twitter you're you're really the revolution shit. will only be televised <laughs> It just what kills me is these people are buying into their own self made legitimacy. And it's such a fucking sad thing. Like, I've never done that. From day one, I'm like, yeah, okay, this Kurt Cobain video I had got uh, 60,000 views. Okay. That means maybe 20,000 people watched it three times. Maybe. Like, it's. Yeah, maybe 10,000 people watched it six times. It's a joke. Like, like the numbers don't mean anything. But you look at the people who will buy into the numbers, and it's like, that's how sad you are. You actually believe this shit. Like, these numbers, I've been screaming. I mean, the first one of the first videos I put up in 2012, Christ, I was like, internet metrics are the biggest fucking joke on the planet. That's, mm-hmm. that's seven years ago or five years ago. Mm-hmm. For real. And I'm like, oh man, people are it's just amazing now. how much it's devolved since then, too. Yeah, but it's also like the popular understanding of how fucking bullshit all this is. It's just now turning the corner. Yeah, like because six, um, six years after I'm ranting about it, people generally are like, maybe this is kind of falsely amplified. Yeah, maybe Spotify is for becoming real. the next uh, record industry of the 1980s where we're just signing people for millions of dollars with no actual intention of paying them based on these these numbers that mean nothing. Well, it doesn't matter because we have a channel, money. we have a way, we have a way to make them famous. We yeah. got a, we got control over the whole fucking thing. Now same it's as yeah. fucking, same as FM radio in the 80s, man. Same as MTV. No, it's no different. We control access, so we control who gets access. And I wrote a big fucking, there's another medium piece I wrote about how I, I went, I spent fucking like six months. I went crazy in 2010 writing this piece because I got access to uh, the Nielsen ratings, SoundScan. So I actually have access to everything in SoundScan. Most people don't because it costs like $65,000 a year, but I have back channel access to everything in SoundScan. And I can tell you some really fucking funny shit, but what I wanted to do with it was say okay it's now demonstrable what happened in the 80s right so they shipped all these records and then they you know buried them in a landfill whatever they did because they can use the numbers to market the artist and lil pump is the same fucking thing and and uzi vert who the fuck these people are you can use the numbers to pump it right if you see big numbers you're like oh well this is a big deal no it's not it's totally fake but if a chart gets the marketing then the charts a thing Mm -hmm. so record charts were the thing in the 80s and they shipped fake numbers of records millions and millions of records they they got 17 million copies of Def Leppard's Hysteria in the channel 17 million okay in the channel just stuffing channel stuffing it's what they do with cars right Mm -hmm. and they got destroyed or whatever so they didn't show up on returns and then you know, after SoundScan came out in 91, two, when everyone realized people are actually buying rap and country records, um, from then on, uh, Hysteria only sold, I think, 3 million copies in eight years. But Ooh. in the three years when it was literally on the charts for a full calendar year in the top 10, it somehow sold 17 million. And it got really fucked up because, uh, just, uh, I'll stop after this, but what happened was there was this mad racist fucking thing that happened where Michael Jackson's thriller could not be allowed to be the best selling album of all time. And so this record label got in a fight with another record label and started stuffing the channel so that the Eagles greatest hits would be the best selling record of all time. And within three years, they artificially moved 18 million copies 
of the Eagles' greatest hits to make it by number the best-selling record of all time. Jesus because Christ. It couldn't be Michael yeah. Jackson's Thriller. I'm not fucking with you. It's totally real. I, I be- no, that's, that's real. That sounds about real. Can't have that black man be the number one selling artist. So, you know, and then it just, you know, boil it down, right? So it's not about, you know, race. It's about who do I represent? Who's my, I'm WME. Mm-hmm. I'm fucking CAA. I'm fucking Live Nation. There's like eight companies that have money that fuck with this stuff. And they're all trying to top each other. And, um, you know, well, go, you got people outside that, you know, you got Kanye comes back, you know, he, he knew I was going to be on Moo. He knew I was going to do this interview. And he's like, okay, well, if Chris is going to be on Moochella, I got to come back on Twitter. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> what I actually want to go back onto the thing of uh, artificially uh, fixing numbers and shit, because I did make a note on this little, uh, this little document I have here of just the, uh, what you've gone on this many times before the privileged kids who aren't really, uh, they don't need to be musicians, but they, they are, and they get more exposure than anyone else who's actually trying and is much more DIY than them. And I don't know uh, if you know about the story. Okay. Here's the story. There's a, there's a music camp, a summer music camp, like a rock band camp. Yeah. In Connecticut. It's in the same town where Anderson Cooper's mansion is. Ooh. It costs $20,000 to send your kid to this camp for six weeks. $20,000. Ezra Koenig went there. L. King went there. And Sarah Dupuis went there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, DIY is fucked, dude. Oh, it's always always been pretty fucked. I think the last true DIY person I think I can think of is um, Robert Pollard of uh, Kind of My Voices. Uh, Okay, look. So... GBV got blown up because Jim Greer wrote it spin. Jim yeah. Greer was dating Kim Deal. It's Ooh. a little bit fucked up, okay? He's dating a girl who's from their town, and she's giving him his tapes, and then he writes them up in spin, and Matador's blown up with pavement, and it just, look, I mean, I like them fine, and it didn't hurt anybody. It's not like they were fucking making bajillions of dollars. But that was all fucking glad handing, ass grabbing bullshit. Oh, it, it's absolutely networking. That's all it is. It's all networking, and that's what you got to do. And the Alien Lanes was fucking awesome. It's one of my favorite records. But B Thousand's just like when I hear fucking people talking about B Thousand, like it was a big deal. I'm like, there's like two good songs. Queens of Cans and Jars is good. Come on, man. It just people get. I don't. There's this, there's people who actually look at this stuff, and then there's people who receive it, and they can't wait to fucking cheerlead. For something that they've bought the fucking story on, and I, I, it's weird. The guy who wrote the B thousand book for the thirty three and a third series yeah. is a professor at Skidmore, where I went. Ooh. I went there back before it was like one of the most fucking expensive, bullshit liberal arts fucking day camps ever. It didn't cost that much when I went there. It was a fucking stupid, you know, dumb liberal arts. You know, you know, you couldn't get into a real school school. Yeah. Like I mean, it was like 20 something yeah. grand. Okay? Oh, that's back when you had the privilege of having those kind of schools. Well, you know, yeah, sure. But the whole, like, like when I went there, it was like, okay, you were, you didn't know what you want to do with your life. You're reasonably intelligent. You can write a good fucking, you know, acceptance essay. Uh, it was 20 something grand, which wasn't nothing in the East, but it wasn't crazy. No. Um, but now, you know, Skidmore's like costs as much as fucking Bowden. I don't know. It's like 60 something grand to fucking go there. And I'm like, what? It's a fucking Cowtown College in fucking Saratoga. Are you shitting me? They're all doing it. They're all fucking jacking the rates up like crazy. It sucks. Mm-hmm. Well, I was just going to um, mention uh, the, the new the new hotness, which I guess you don't really want to go into. Since you mentioned it. The new hotness of the, the artist I've got a little of a bone to pick with is uh, Claro, the the girl who blew up out of nowhere whose dad works for converse's marketing gimmick or their yeah. entire marketing department yeah so like look, did the... Frankie cosmos already no that's frankie cosmos is her dad's uh chris klein kevin, kevin klein. klein yeah you go it's got nothing to do with her dad yeah it's nothing for... to do with her dad it's just she had money and opportunity no dude her mother is phoebe cates phoebe cates oh. is, is phoebe cates stands to inherit the cates fortune it has a yeah. name. It is oh, the shit. Kate's fortune. I didn't her know that part. Her grandfather invented the $64,000 question. The oh most God. profitable television show in like up until the 80s. Um, you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. And like man. whatever, man. Like, dude, look. 
if she came out and did fucking Madonna stuff and pop star shit, okay. But yeah, don't don't go fucking pallying and pallying with the people. I don't want to name names. That no, yeah, feel feel free not. And it's just she just greased everybody. You can be my buddy and hang out with me, and and you know fucking. I just it's sickening. Like the mm-hmm. lies, the fucking phony, you know, realness of these people yeah. that they sell. It's just fucking stupid. Well, you have the, the money, you have the money to go into a studio and bang out a fucking Rihanna track. You could mm-hmm. do whatever you want, but you want to pretend to be, you know, down with the fucking kids and be fucking DIY and here's my tape. It's just sickening, man. Like, it just sickens me. Like, your fucking output has to be at par with your, like, wealth, with your ability to fucking dominate a capitalist society. Like, you, 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 you lie and you pretend to be this struggling thing that needs people's help, that needs, you know, journalists' help. And it's like, either you're rich and lying or you're somebody's friend. Either way, I don't I don't see a distinction between either of those. Like Swearin's got signed, man. Oh, well, that's really weird. She's best friends with the fucking three dominant editors of Pitchfork. How did that happen? God, I haven't even followed that that whole situation yet. I didn't even read into that one. I, I just know, saw that I just saw that Swearin got signed. That's all I did. I saw that today. Yeah, really crazy how that happened. I don't know how you can possibly get a deal together. It's just it, it, you know, look, man. It's, if people were more honest about shit, it would be great. Cause yeah, who cares? I don't give a shit if you're rich. Just tell me you're rich. Yeah, you I don't. Know? Yeah, I don't like, like the posturing that you struggled in an apartment to make your first Frankie Cosmos record. Oh, it was really hard. I had a really tough time. You know, I had like a full I, set, studio set up in my my living room, man. It was tough. I grew up in a doorman building, and um, you know, I had a really <laughs> tough time. Yeah, you because know, sometimes he wasn't there, and it took me a while to get a fucking cab. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, like I, especially since I thought I grew up thinking there was still something more of a DIY scene. I thought it would still blow up because local scene. I was near local scene, a bunch of crust punks in the middle of Los Angeles, you know, all the Mexicans and shit. And they still, the Vice is still trying to Whoa, invade that that's scene. That's fucking way racist. Come on, man. What? Come on, you can't say Mexicans and shit. What are you, Morrissey? <laughs> oh, because oh, I don't want to say that. I, I don't know if they're all Nicaraguan. No, 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 it's okay. Yeah, Whoa, Mexicans, well, what's wrong with Nicaragua? Nothing's wrong with them. I love them. I hung out with all of them. All I'm of them. Being, I'm not. I'm not saying it in a derogatory way. I'm saying that I don't know exactly which part you of every. Listen, part of man. Me. You can't say I'm not saying it in a derogatory way, and it's not derogatory. I interpret that as derogatory, <laughs> and I am really offended. And I am going to drag your fucking ass across Twitter for fucking three uh, weeks. Excuse me. You are excuse dead. me. Excuse me, Frox. This is violence, and I will not stand for it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you have but, uh, totally fucking impinged upon my rights. <laughs> I went from hanging out with a bunch of dudes in, in a garage playing noise core and listening to Michael Jackson's Thriller on an old beat up uh, 1940s record player for the army that they found in an abandoned house to seeing that none of that was going to matter because you could get something like Frankie Cosmos together or whatever was happening in Toronto, I guess. Anyone who's connected to broken social scene got a career. <laughs> well, think about all, it, man. All like, you have to do is put together a myth, basically. Yeah, yeah, it's a myth. It is a myth. It's if a you have enough money, you can sell it to the public without any effort. It's, it's like those cheesy myth. comedy skits where they make fun of the 80s hair metal bands for having fake British, British accents, only they got rid of the accents. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, man. Um, this goes... Look, I, I don't, I don't want to make this about what's going on now, because yeah. you can go back. David Bowie had a pretty good upbringing. Robert yeah. Smith was doing okay. You Baby know, pop. like... No, no not, you're wrong. it's always been this way. <laughs> it's always been rich kids. It's always been rich kids dicking around. The thing that's fucked mm. up, like I was thinking about this today because I knew we were going to talk tonight. I don't remember the band name and I didn't have time to look it up. There was a band who released a seven inch called like Kim Foutley, or something about Kim Foutley. Oh. And they were like a radical, loud feminist band. And I was like, you're 19. You saw the Runaways movie, and you think Kim Fowley is a Malcolm McLaren avatar. And I'm like, if you knew anything about music, if that was your first impulse to, to go figure out who is Kim Fowley, 
the first thing you would have heard is that he was the biggest fucking piece of shit who ever walked the West Coast. He was yeah. a mad fucking manipulative, psychotic, orgy, sex, fuck up, psycho. And then after this band put the seven inch out, there was some, you know, thing about Joan Jett or Cherry Curry bio book or something where they were like, yeah, yeah he straight up sexually assaulted me. They may have even said he raped them. I mean, no, he, they did. I read about this recently. But mm -hmm. like, if you needed that to to quantify for you how much of a piece of shit that guy was, you really needed to do a little more research because mm -hmm. you're just you you're 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 almost famousing reality. You're you watch the movie, and it's all great, and oh, it's it was exhausting and tough, and what a what a crazy hard time. But like if you actually fucking talk to people or, or read, just dig up the fucking, you know, articles, interviews, whatever. It's all out there, man. Like you just didn't do any fucking work and you wanted to use the chic that you bought, that you bought into. Mm -hmm. That this guy was like a radical, you know, Svengali of this fucking Svengali thing. And it's like. Dude, even the guy who played him in the movie knew that this guy was a fucking piece of shit. And they cut that out of the movie because they didn't want to make it about him. I'm surprised Ario Pink got no backlash for that, having him on his pom-pom uh, -pom record, having him write like four songs on it. Well, nobody gives a shit about Ariel Pink anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't anymore. But at the time, I think he was still just coming off of what was the last bit of the Before Today hype. Are you the, are you the one who's trying to fucking post all the shit on Moo about Ariel Pink and like get people to think about him again? Is that you? No, I'm not doing anything. I haven't posted there in a long time. I haven't how given come a shit every about time, that. How come every time I go into the Moo catalog, like nine fucking pictures of Mad Villain uh spider -like. it's the same fucking records every time like it's this is the best record ever it, it, it's, well, it's a constant circulating off. cycle of teenagers who are listening to the same lists of people there was this old yeah. image that was made on the board called the uh, the mu essentials list and mu it was essentials essentially stuff. everything yeah. from the work lists and the spin lists all categorized into what people like the most so it omitted some classics yeah, it, here and there yeah it's basically the uh rym top charts yeah like just boiled down into a short list. What is and we've been circulating that since like 2010. What's it's, it's never changed. Oh, right, your music. Uh, right, your music. Oh God! So this is something I've never interfaced with. But people have asked me about this. Yeah. And like, honestly, you got <laughs> this is fucking. So when Last FM came out, like when it came out, mm -hmm. I was around, and the first thing I said was. Oh, let me help you codify my behavior as a music listener. Here, let me feed mm -hmm. you everything I do. So you can be like, what a fucking joke. Like, this is, I've never had a Facebook account. Like, anything that's not, like, demonstrably anonymized or, or that you're capable of, of, of kind of deflecting as a persona behavior on the internet. I've never fucking <laughs> interfaced with any of it, because like from I grew no, up with it, man. I had a web page. Just masturbating your own taste at that point. Yeah, but it's you're not just you're not just doing that. You're giving it to these fucking services to can your ass. <laughs> exactly. And like, like you, you don't I grew, even have to wait for the data miners to grab it. You're already right. giving it away. So like I had like a fake not fake. I mean I released records. I had a band and I registered a website in like 1997 and like Mora at Mora and all these people and people are dead fucking Ben Brown. Like they're, you don't even know any of these people are 411 burner fucking like pillow fight. Like the, you don't know, you don't have any idea how wild West, what wild West could mean in terms of the internet. Cause you weren't there for it. That's not your fault. But at the same time, like, <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> You're blaming like me. Like <laughs> you can't, you can't be, you can't be responsible for not understanding things like Audio Galaxy and and like writing your own HTML when like barely any browsers could interpret HTML. Like I learned HTML to communicate to people, to like ten people. I had like I... a fucking website for my band, my fake loop music DJ shadow wannabe crap I did as the Grace Period in the late nineties. And like, yeah. 
you literally would get no there's no feedback there's no social media nobody's liking anything you do you just update the page and you just hope someone noticed you have no idea when we were doing pitchfork when pitchfork started getting big i knew how pitchfork how big pitchfork was in 2002 and three because i was involved in technology and i could figure it out the people who the person who owned pitchfork had no fucking clue and all these other fucking music writers at magazines who didn't, like I said, you know, earlier, they didn't even have real websites. They had no idea how big the internet was. I could see it because I was tracking some data that nobody else knew how to track. I mean, people mm. did, but not many music writers knew how to track. And I was going around and fucking with everybody. I was like, we're bigger than fucking spin. We're bigger than Rolling Stone. Fuck you. You're nobody. And they were like, yeah. <laughs> oh, Pitchfork, you're so cute. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I can tell you right now, man, fucking 88,000 people read my review of, you know, fucking Hail to the Thief. How, how many copies of that Rolling Stone magazine sell last week? It's just, it's fucked, man. It's just the narrative gets controlled by the people who want to minimize disparity. All the things I'm talking about, they don't ever want that to come out because it kills their narrative. No, it feels, it makes it feel like a miserable place to be in music and they never want always to be a, an uplifting thing to be yeah that's why i did the, that's why i did a little off joke in the screenshots on road and scene because it's like dude this is the lifeblood of every indie dork in college in the 90s and there were only about seventy five thousand of us and the yep. numbers the numbers absolutely fucking confirm that no one read your zine only 15 people in your friends group did you you went the same 250 people went to every show in your town that's it. It's nothing. Yeah. Nobody gives a shit about music except dorks. No. But the, we got all this noise. We got all this fucking noise going around and it's helping these PR companies and it's helping these record labels. And so we all buy into the story and then the amplification, the false amplification of all this shit while we're retweeting each other. Why have I got 150 retweets? What if that's actually 150 people? Is that, yeah, is I that mean, maybe. really like a big <laughs> deal? that's a that's a big room of, of people <laughs> it just it, it's infuriating and and in, it, like i said man you know this weird window where i left the internet has made it nakedly clear to people like you and to other music fans that like this thing has gotten distorted to a point where it's not like you complain like i was complaining about advertising and and, and hypocrisy and all this shit now it's like this isn't even fucking real little pump no, it's, no. Gang, gang, it's gang, a completely gang, alien gang. world at this point. It's fucking total bullshit. So, I have to tell you, uh, you. I think this is a between the gap period of us talking last. There was a, a shit poster on 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 the Moo who went by. I, I can't remember his name, but he invented the term meme rap. He coined oh, it was that. Du- thing. It was a guy named WWW. Uh, w- it was yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm. And I'm he, actually. He I'm actually unfortunately foresaw the fucking future of what hip hop would be, how it would be marketed, like Gucci Gang. So like like look, Fantano doesn't talk about this stuff, but he understands it. Yeah, he's got a service and audience. You know this, mm-hmm. um, but he's been talking, you know, offline or online. I don't know, but for a while now, he's like, this is actually going to crack. The fucking shell is going to crack, and something insane is going to come out of hip hop. And for a while, we were talking about XXX Tentation, mm-hmm. and then. Because the grindcore record, the first record, which I was, I wasn't on the internet really when it hit, and I was like, "This is it!" Like, I Spooky Black was the Christ. I remember to me. Spooky Black when that came out, like 2012, 13, whatever it was. Like, I was driving around in my car. I was working in fucking God, God, my so long ago. I was working on Cape Cod, and I was driving around to YouTube from Spooky Black's album, just like for two hours just on loop it was so fucking perfect because he was so naked and like he wasn't dumb he didn't give a shit it was this weird thing of like i feel this shit so fucking hard but i'm fucking white and i live in the middle of nowhere but i don't give a shit and i'm gonna fucking put on the black turtleneck and the chain and the Mm -hmm. fucking head wrap and like this is Mm -hmm. like i don't fucking care if i don't make it if i don't live up to this but i love it and i'm gonna fucking try to be it as hard as i can and I was just like, he's, he was the fucking God to me, this little kid, you know? And then it just fucking went in the fucking tank, like you're saying. And 
until I heard that 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 early like grindcore screamo XXX record. When I heard that, I was like, okay, maybe the, maybe 2011 to 2013 wasn't a perfect moment. Maybe we can do it again. And then it was like all this shit came out about him, and I'm like, fuck. Like, what do you fucking do, man? It's one thing if you find out that Bowie, you know, slept with underage girls. If you find out that Led Zeppelin slept with underage girls and carried a 14 year old around on tour with them, and yeah. you still listen to fucking Led Zeppelin, you find out Gary Glitter was a fucking sexual predator, fucking pedophile piece of shit. You find it out after the fact, okay? But now you're finding it out in real time. Mm -hmm. And I made that tweet where I was like, okay, you want to put out some music? We're going to do a Corey check and a fucking, you know, we're going to find out whatever post you made on the internet. And then maybe when we're done with that, we, we yeah. found out that you're not a fucking liability. We'll fucking talk about your music. Where are your receipts? Give me all of your information that you've ever sent a text message to somebody. Because... Oh, it turns out when you were fucking, you're a teenager and you wrote some bullshit on the internet. The dude from Death Heaven, all these people yeah. that get fucking dragged for shit they wrote when they were fucking 17. We, we were on that one. God, I forgot about that. I remember when that happened and like we were on no, the I was on that squad too. for that. I was on that because that fucking, you know, person was trying to drag me. And I was like, okay, but you're opening for this band. You good with that shit? Huh. Yeah. Well, well, no, that they were younger, and and it's not fair. Well, and that that is that's Hello? exactly the thing is when you're 15 and you're you're saying the word faggot on the internet in 2006, whenever that was, that was that was just a different like, time. Jeremy, yeah, Jeremy Larson yeah. just wrote this thing about Eminem on you know last weekend on Pitchfork. And he's yeah. talking about Eminem, and he's like, look, dude, yeah, this shit doesn't hit 2018. No. Huh. It, it was it was edgy. It was edgy back then. I remember it. It was insane. Look, I mean, I didn't like Eminem. I thought he was a fucking mall rat piece of shit. No, I thought the same thing. My brother is exactly that. My brother is the definition of wigger, and he loves Eminem. And I just like look at the time. I was like, do we need this? Like, I don't want the Eminem thing. I don't want this like aggressive hate shit. I want jackass where you're making fun of yourself mm -hmm. and, and the early two thousands is sort of split that way. Like you're an angry mall rat white kid and Eminem has granted you access to cool, oh, to fuck. black, to black cool. Oh God. I feel it. You know, like you can be down cause Eminem's down. Dre's co-signing that shit, man. You can be Where's down. The coolest. All my black and, friends will think I'm the coolest for liking this. And I'm like, look, dude, I'm not black. I'm a pretty <laughs> fucking well-off white kid. And and my shit is like, it was just like I grew up with skate videos, fucking whiskey. Yeah. You know, skate like. Videos. I got a lot of my taste, too. <laughs> man, that's fucking like GNS footage, like, you know, garbage, like all these fucking videos. Man, if fucking kids, like, if kids today could see Barbarians at the Gate, like, Heath Kirchhart literally sells crack in a bar in St. Louis because these black guys are like, as ah, this, this fucking 16 year old white kid in my fucking, you know, fucked up hood bar. He puts the crack rock in Heath Kirchhart's hand, and another guy gives him money and takes it out of his hand. He literally sells crack transactionally in this video. And you were like, cool. Fucked up. <laughs> Fuck it. Go. And this is before Vice. This is before Vice even was a magazine, dude. 94, yeah. four, five. And then Vice comes out and we were into Vice. Like we were mad into Vice, dude. Rating drugs, like fucking crazy low life shit. Like Supreme, I, all this stuff. It's a continuity of like white people being like, we suck so bad <laughs> that like we gotta just fucking go all the way down. And that was the, the whole thing, you know? Like I said whiskey a minute ago, like that whiskey video is just drunk, fucking stupid, dumbass white guys snowboarding and fucking drinking and just doing dumb shit because Look, man, you don't. What's your voice? What do you? Who? What, like, what the fuck, man? Yeah, everybody <laughs> needs to hear about you. You got a fucking real platform, and um, I like the stuff, like Jackass, that wasn't about trying to fucking co-op social territory. 
mm-hmm. I didn't like the backpacker shit where all these white kids were like trying to be down and it pissed me off and it just, I thought it was bullshit and I thought they were fucking racist. I thought they were totally fucking racist for being like so loud about Supreme Wu Tang, all this like kids, the movie kids and, <laughs> and all this shit at that time. I was like, man, like Chloe Savigny and all this fucking crap. I'm just like, fuck you, you know, like stay in your lane, man. Stay in your fucking lane. I don't know. Stay in your lane. Well, if it's a gala on screen. Like, dude, 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 like, dude, do black people need me to hook them up? I don't think so. They need their own fucking community to deal with the shit they're dealing with. Like, there was that article, like, last week about flaneur. You can't be flaneur black people anymore. You can't just fucking coast because they're going after you. In that community, like, what, that's not, that's an invalid opinion. Of course it's fucking valid. It's fucking horrible. White people don't understand. They're never going to understand. No. So it just, I always had a fucking problem with that. I just, that's why I don't talk about fucking hip hop ever. I don't and ever I, talk about it. I, as this much is the reason like, I've grown up with hip hop my whole life, but it's never been the genre I grew up and got accustomed to. That was always the skating and punk shit that I did. That was it. I, yeah. And, and like, look, man, you go back to the Beastie Boys. It was, you know, like they were, it's like the Beastie Boys, the original Eminem. Yeah. They're the ones who it was like black people were like, they're fucking good. Like, this is fucking crazy. Like, looking down the barrel of a gun, fucking Paul's Boutique. Like, there's nobody who loved hip hop who wasn't like, this shit is on. Like, it was fucking amazing. And because they had the money, because they were yeah. the white hope, they were the white hope. So they got yeah. all the money and they got the fucking leash to do that record. And, um, they did right by the whole culture, like the whole culture of hip hop, Paul's boutique. They did right by that shit. And then when they came back, it was like, I don't know, man, it just got fucking weird to check your head. Like, um, oh, what the fuck is that song? God damn. My favorite song ever. And I can't even think of the title right now. Cause I, uh, the fucking the the huge fucking um the one with the bad brain sample come on hook me up oh oh no i lost it <laughs> i know exactly if we had the like we had one guy who's actually a fucking super huge pulse boutique fan i can't think of what it is either. pass the mic pass the mic pass the mic there you go so that's exactly like, it pass the mic to me i'm a drummer and when i heard that fucking loop i was like like past the mic was almost like window liquor to me. Like, like fucking, mm-hmm. you know, like that many years earlier when I heard that, I was like, fuck man, it's they're sampling fucking hardcore. And they got this fucking swing and bang and fucking beat and they're good. They had fucking sick flow. The BC boys had fucking sick flow, not on license to ill really. Cause that was still corny ass no. fucking Def Jam shit. But when they got into Paul's boutique and then license, it was just like, fuck this sucks in a way. Like as much as I love it, it's totally fucking keeping down black voices. Yep. Um, and I made a joke of, uh, a few weeks ago on Twitter about Debrat. You know, they make mm-hmm. these lists about the top ten women, f- f- top hundred and fifty albums by women. Debrat's uh, not Hill. on it. Lauren Debrat's Hill. not on it. Debrat sold. It was the first <laughs> fucking female hip hop hip hop artist to sell a million records. Like yep. That shit fucking ripped. I love it. You barely it. see what? Salt and Pepper mentioned anymore, which is like insane to me, because that well, was always the go-to for me as a kid. Like that was the go-to women rap group. That's well, it. That, for me, is MC. Pepper. Yeah, for me, it's MC Light. But like, I'm, I'm mm, old. That's another one. And it, it, but, it, but, but it's just it's frustrating as shit because these messages get fucked up. It's the, it's the record company, it's the fucking industry, it's the fans. Any one of these variables can fuck things up and fuck you up from just like getting the real shit and it, it it's it's a fucked up thing when college kids start listening to tribe and then like artists like black fucking hip-hop artists start pivoting to try and get down with that because it's working you can't they what the fuck choice do they have they have to do that mm-hmm. and you get fucked over by the market where you you know and that's the whole epmd crossover new jack swing period where rap artists were like, fuck you, dude. Fuck your Zoot Suit shit, man. Fuck you. You're selling this shit out. And I don't know, man. Again, hard fucking thing to talk about as a privileged white guy. 
but I grew up with the explosion of hip hop. I mean, that shit was everywhere. I fucking Schooly D was the fucking shit to me when I was a kid. When I went to camp when I was ten years old, we had fucking Dougie Fresh as the show. Like, and, and a kid <laughs> brought that up because he lived in the Bronx, and uh, and uh, we went to YMCA camp in Frost Valley in New York. Yeah, and he had uh, the show, and I was, and it was Inspector Gadget. So you're a child, and the Inspector <laughs> Gadget theme. When you're a child, the Inspector Gadget theme is pretty fucking funny. Yeah. And uh, it just gets fucked up, man. This 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 whole hip hop black music thing. Go back to the fucking blues, whatever, doo wop. You know, it just it just keeps getting fucked up. Where like you get this cycle of black artists breaking through cleanly, and then yep. the second that happens, they get fucking crushed by imitations of what they're doing. I don't know, man. What do you think of a uh, what was it, little little ugly man, little ugly man out of uh, the south? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I look, man. I leave that shit over to fucking Jason DeMarco. <laughs> like, I leave that over to fucking Clark Noble One, baby. Um, Jason you know, DeMarco he... cares about Little Ugly Man. I haven't seen him care about shit in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was talking about the new Sleep Record yesterday. He was, but you know, he's a he's a man in the in the in the audience where he's at. Sleep is absolutely the Adult Swim market. Y- you're not fucking with my boy because I'm gonna fucking take you out. No, I love Jason DeMarco. <laughs> I think he's doing a great I job with Tsunami and shit. Like, as, yeah, as a I'm child, like what? Do you need your fucking approval? Get the fuck out of here. That motherfucker is <laughs> bringing in shit that you would never fucking have the ability to fucking bring to no. popular cultures. Like, would you have? You wouldn't even have fucking anime weebos out there, motherfucker. No, he wouldn't. I love that. That's a fucking yeah. great thing. I don't even like half the shit he brings over, but he's bringing it over. He's, no, so he's doing fucking... it. I'm absolutely like I am very surprised at everything he just put on for the April. 4th. Adult Swim, he did an all subs only anime yep, broadcast. Yep, yep, yep. Just because of Twitter bitches. I yes. can't say that word. Fuck, I can't say that word anymore. <laughs> um, but like, look, dude, that guy fucking pulled L through some hard shit. Yeah. I mean, like, I, look, dude, I mean, it's fucked for me because he grew up down the street in Plymouth. Oh, that's and, awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah, he grew up in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and we had a lot of fucking common ground and shit. And then, like, we had some deep talks about hip hop because I'm like, look, I'm not comfortable talking about this shit. I'm fucking privileged white guy. I talk about the cure. Like, that's dude, a good, I can't. That's a good thing to talk about. No, it's not. I mean, <laughs> it's not a lucrative thing to talk about. It's a good thing like to talk about. Fucking staring in the mirror, dude. Like, I, you know, you don't need me. You don't need me to tell you about what's going on in hip hop. You got fucking so many shrimp and all these fucking people and Dave Turner and all. Like, th- this is well covered territory. I'm not a voice these that anyone needs. But the point that I'm trying to make is he's putting money behind that shit. Big fucking money. Mm-hmm. And it's not his money. He's convincing people that this yeah. is worth investing in. You cannot fuck with that. No, without him, I don't think Flying Lotus Los Angeles sound would have blown up as much as it, it did because Adult Swim was blasting that shit. Yep. It, he helped, so uh, I'm helped just a lot. That- there, there, there's good people out there. They're doing. There the is, they can. and I'm always, and, uh, I always love the good people. As much as people, you know, they they yell at him on the, the internet. He, you love the good. You love the good people. Yeah. You feel the good people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm getting like, mean. I, I don't even know, man. <laughs> um, no, I just there's so few people that have done like you can't even imagine the fucking meetings he's been in. To mm-hmm. convince people to convince people who have no idea what the fuck he's talking about that they should put a quarter of a million dollars behind some bullshit like it's just fucking crazy and it, it i mean so we're coming around full circuit of the killer mike thing um killer mike straight up just went to him and was like i trust you i believe in you i believe in what you're doing and i want you to put up my record that's yep. fucking crazy that's just fucking crazy because he went to Mike and was like, I don't know how to do this. I have no idea to, how to do what you would want somebody to do. If you're Pusha, if you're, if you're any of these guys, if you want to game up on fucking hip hop, I'm the last person you should ask to help you do that. And he was like, I don't fucking care. I trust you fucking put it out. And it, you know, yeah, it didn't do what it could have done if he'd hooked up with those type of people. But uh, you you got very few, very few um, good voices, good people out there who are going to help. And uh, it gets worse and worse every year. That's all I'm saying. 
Yeah. There's nobody. There's nobody going to fucking help you make good music bigger. It's just not going to fucking happen. No. You got they got to sell themselves out to a publicity firm or some sort. They got to get their connections going or else you're not going to get noticed. The weird thing too is it's not even the PR firms anymore. It's fucking artists themselves cuz of Insta. Insta. Oh, that's and, true. That's true. Yeah, you can sell yourself out real quick. Um, you know, I wrote a while ago and I've mentioned on Twitter like I think back on Ian Connor and I'm like that fucking kid was perfect. I mean, he was the next step up from Tyler and Earl and all that perfect, like, 2011. I mean, I keep talking about this, but, like, kids are starting to turn the corner and realize, like, 2011 to 2013 was, like, full-on fucking punk rock, 77 to it was. 79. It really was. You had Unicorn Kid, fucking Elite Gymnastics, like, all these great fucking white rave bands that were so fucking smart and, and brilliant and, and loved dance music and, and house club techno. And they did the funniest fucking coolest shit. I've always repped for finally boys who just vanished. No, oh, yeah. but the I mean, witch finally house. boys. Yeah. Well, and then, and then Salem and, and I loved all that shit. And like you had people like Chris Weingarten, Rolling Stone, who was like, fuck you, you fucking, you know, shitty white hype merchant bullshit fucking people who are like totally fucking scamming on black music. Like you're fucking pitch shifting your voice down to sound black. That is so fucking racist. And he's right. He's right in a way. Um, but um, that whole period, man, vapor waves beginning grimes mm. on fuck grimes everywhere. Fucking MTV. everyone who grimes is associated with like purity ring and uh, Cecil Frena and all that shit. Yeah. All the gymnastics. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and like the MTV goes and gets on the bus with Tyler because they're like, fuck, we can't, what, we just, we, we, we fold. We, you, you beat us. Yeah. You gained the game. You gained the game, and now you're the shit. So Earl and Tyler, we're just going to fucking point a camera at your face because we have no idea, no idea what the fuck's going on. Like, you're going to Your squad was, was Jackass 2.0, and it didn't work as well, but it was definitely well, the adds to the cult of personality of Tyler. Yeah, no shit. Um, but I, you know, I, so I saw all that shit end and, and I felt like it was kind of, and I should have fucking checked that earlier than I did. Honestly, I should have got off the internet in like 2014, 15, because I spent that last year just being a dick <laughs> is not a great open. It's not a great sell, like no. being an asshole to everybody. But I did that for like eight months and people were just like, fuck you. Like you suck. Just, you know, I'm, I'm bored. I'm tired. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, you're just a dick about everything. And look, I mean, nobody's going to stand up and be like, you're right. My entire life is a fiction. I work for the enemy. <laughs> I'm a bad person. <laughs> like, it's not going to happen. <laughs> no, they're going to have the poetic uh, deathbed speech. I just, I, I, I stayed in probably, you know, a little bit too long, but whatever. You know, I, I, I it was great being away from it. I had a kid. Um. Uh, my fourth kid. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah. So she was born on the Brexit 623, Ooh. the literal day. So I call her Brexit Jones. Um, that's great. That's a good name, though. That's like a that's like a Frank Zappa name. Well, so two, <laughs> two of my kids have jokey meme Internet names, uh, Baby Grimes and, Bre and Brexit Jones. The other two don't have Internet -y names because I wasn't like doing Internet shit when they were born. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they're a product of, the, of your period of life yeah, i guess but um yeah I, I, you know i think everyone's right to look back on that period because that was the period where advertising writing blank checks like pitchfork vice everything they were just pissing money mm -hmm. at all of them because they didn't know what the fuck was going on the advertisers lost control during that period because like so i'll give you some inside baseball right uh when i was leaving pitchfork uh the person who owned it was trying to woo the advertising director from the onion to come to pitchfork oh. right when that happened is when i said fuck you because that person did not pay me money that they promised to pay me for all the work i'd done for four years fucking candlelight two in the morning getting up at fucking six to go to work um they didn't pay me and I told them, I am going to take this out of you in blood or teeth if you don't cut me this check and you do not want to go down that road. 
and they were so fucking lazy and stupid that they didn't realize like i could have cut ch- i could have cut chris out a check for four thousand dollars and none of this would have happened <laughs> was it really worth it when you sold no. your website for 35 million dollars and had no. to had to delete all my reviews because i was going to sue your ass like <laughs> it was just dumb as fuck but anyway so he got the guy from the onion to come over and help him understand how to run a business and then that guy around about 2007 got mark geiger to come in mark geiger runs uh wme uh, mm-hmm. artist management mark geiger started Lollapalooza. he managed the pixies he started Lollapalooza after being on tour with the Pixies for a while. Uh, and he had just, I mean, there's very few people have, who have the number of contacts and power that this guy has. He runs, he ran WME. And so this person who came on from the onion was like psyched about that. And then he became a silent partner in pitchfork in 2009. Uh, and so when he became a silent partner, um, that's when you started seeing things like quest love mentioning pitch in interviews and like all sorts of weird stuff like them showing up in time magazine and mainstreamy, you know, normalizing. And then, uh, around about 2011, this person, I guess, I don't, I don't know, whatever. So this other person started bringing Condé Nast, in like 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 grooming Condé Nast to take over Pitchfork, so like by 2013, when it's peak independence and peak profitability and peak drugs, um, you'd go to a Pitchfork event and like everyone there was from Condé Nast, <laughs> and so like over the next two years they navigated this, and then in October 2015 they straight out bought Pitchfork, and at that point I just walked away because I knew that the primary person from this website had like been to rehab a couple times and like it was totally out of control. And then when they signed the deal, they followed me on Twitter after having blocked me for like three years, they followed me and they're like, Hey, what's going on? Hey, what's up, man? (laughs) When it got, when it, when it got announced and my response tweet to that was, Hey man, sounds great is your lockup 18 months? And then they blocked me immediately. Again. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if you know what a lockup is, but when you, when you buy a company, you have a lockup with the key man. So key man insurance is like you buy insurance against that person dying. So they had key man insurance and they also had a lockup with the purchase and the lockup was 18 months. And the second, literally the week after that 18 months expired, Chris Kasky quit Pitchfork and he posted a fucking handwritten note about it, which was a fucking diss on me for my handwritten pavement slant and enchanted review. (laughs) One of the biggest reviews Pitchfork ever ran. Yeah. That was a good review. Yeah, it was all right. But anyway, the point is all, all all these people walked all these people got two people were Pitchfork. Like the LLC of Pitchfork was two people. It was the guy who started it. And then Chris Kasky. And Chris was like, he looked at Pitchfork like any other fucking startup. Like he went to fucking uh, dinners where you had to pay 750 bucks a plate to meet him. Yeah. That's cool as shit. I don't know if you guys know about industry dinners, but there's all these events when you go to South by and, and you know, fucking the Met uh, fashion show. There's all these events where you have to pay like a thousand dollars a plate to go to dinner with these media scions and grease them and all this bullshit. This thing was greased for a long fucking time, and very few people got the cash reward of selling Pitchfork to Condé Nast. And the second, like, I've dicked on uh, this fucking asshole who runs Condé Nast Digital um, on Twitter a bunch of times, like. This guy spends more time doing cable crossovers at Equinox than you can imagine. His triceps are huge. That's sick. Uh, <laughs> his triceps are huge. That's going to be the quote we're going to put on this art on this whole. He, I mean, like the idea that Pitchfork is is owned and operated and governed by this fucking like 
late 40s early 50s dick shit with his fucking giant neck muscles and <laughs> like i don't know if you saw that i posted a fucking filtered screen grab of his instagram where he's like when you get all your brands on the same platform you got to put it on a t-shirt baby and oh like, man is is it like neck thickness like trent reznor in the mid-2000s Oh God, no! It's it's way worse than that. It's way. How is it worse than that? That's like the the most. His ne- well, this is this is the funny thing. His neck's like a tree trunk. Like I'm a pretty big dude, but this guy would fucking wreck me. So for me to be talking shit about <laughs> him, he would stomp my ass out. Like it would be fucking American History X shit up in this piece. What is what is you know how is it that we've gone back from forums? It went from chat rooms to forums. Now we're back to chat rooms again. Yeah, so I think that's the immediacy thing. Like, you don't want this shit on the internet forever. Like I got opinion posts yeah, from. We did go over that part, didn't we? Don't want we don't want receipts. I got fucking opinion posts from two thousand and two that are still like online. Like I want drunk shit I posted in fucking two thousand and nine. Yeah, I want that on the internet. I yeah. want that. I want everyone to read that fucking crap. Like. You know, the most offensive fucking dumb shit you thought you were saying to fucking 35 people on a fucking message board. It's still there. <laughs> That's great for me. I, I'm loving I had, that shit. I had my posts on this old teen forum, which I talked to a bunch of people. This is like or 2002 when it started. It was pretty early on. And there's just old posts of mine uh, on this teen forum. There's other shit. There's more, more embarrassing things than what I said on there. But the fact that there is a forum out there and someone has the data of these posts these people made. And there's just it's so much weird internet drama that comes with that kind of shit with forums because there's entire honestly, like personas made. Well, it's I'm honestly really, really thankful that the only forum I frequented when I was a teen regularly wiped their posts. Well, it I wasn't for chat. That's not even something that I would have considered because I just thought, you know, it's going into a fucking bucket and whatever. And then the thing that killed it was everyone started using the internet. And you just need one person to scrape back and find that post where you were like, I don't don't even know, you know, I don't even know. But one of the the one where you kind of just lost your shit. (laughs) You're you're fucking shit faced at two in the morning. You had a bad day. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) There you go. Yeah. Your boss happens to be a lesbian or something and you call her out and you get drunk and you're angry. No, I was always talking about <laughs> musicians and, and people like that. But anyway, one one thing that's a weird fucking gap with this is Live Journal. So I'm oh, too yeah. I'm too old to have ever even known about Live Journal because by that <laughs> time, by that time, I had social media exhaustion. This is before Twitter exists, okay? And yeah. I had social media exhaustion. So I never had a live journal. I had a blog spot and I just like input output. I wrote something, I posted it. You commented, I commented back. Yeah. Live journal, live journal sapped and and drained down all of the MySpace kids. And it was exceedingly, exceedingly young. And when you hear about this shit, like the real estate guy in Pine Grove and brand new. This is w- this weird fucking gap where Live Journal was like a fucking predatory, fucked up fan uh, oh concentration thing. And these fucking douchebag, fucking psychopaths in these quote unquote emo bands who were being interpreted as like honest and real and touring and they've so many emotions man and they would, they would get these live journal buzz shows together they go to the show it's like i have multiple fucking stories from women um that are now oh, like yeah, in the, pr- probably in their early 30s but like they're like i was 15 i was 16 and i went to this fucking emo yeah, show some band i followed on live journal this guy cornered me in the fucking dressing room and he was just, and yeah, it, it's, it's no secret anymore. We, we, we all grew up with that. Out. At least I did. I remember the MySpace predatory things. I remember being on MySpace and the live journals and shit. I remember and like the guys in these the guys in these bands are like twenty four, right? Mm-hmm. And their entire fan base is direct contact with thirteen year olds. And I'm like, 
Yeah, they they weren't even close. They weren't even close shutters about this shit. It was like out there for people to see. Blood on the dance floor was a thing, and there's still a thing. Somehow they still have a fan base. And I, I'm like, look, dude, when I'm in my 20s, like when I was in my 20s, I'm trying to find a peer, a peer, dude, somebody my age who thinks the way I do. That's all I wanted. Like, who the fuck is trying to fucking take advantage of fucking teenage like it's i don't get it it's fucked up what's wrong with you like where's your fucking filter it's, man it's some weird thing and this is the thing i've never just i can't leave my head with it that pop punk and emo bands of the time i they're all predators to me they're all predators until proven innocent and that's and just how it is dude, because I, of fucking, it. I opened for blink 182 when they were on cargo yeah and they were like you you could you've never seen three guys less interested in the audience of women like they were just like this is jail this is jail hi jail like you've seen the vine where the guy's like hey what's going on how old are you i'm 15 ah! like that's, yeah. <laughs> that's everyone's reaction at that time you would play a show at a college you play a show at a fucking some town an all ages show and it's like oh god you're really nice. Thank you for listening to my record. You go in the back and you drink some beer and you're just like, let's get in the van, man. We got to go. Like, there's never a thought. Mm -hmm. You know your audience is younger than you. Blink knew mm -hmm. their audience was so fucking young. Yes. Totally knew that. As crazy as this fucking asshole is with his UFO bullshit. Like, He's got evidence, man. He's got it all. You see that fucking Tylenol pill flying across the water? That's Fuck. fucking aliens. That's aliens, man. You ever see those fucking balloon f fucking things floating in South <laughs> America, man? But like, you know, as much like it's it's fucked because you got like I come from that background of like pop punk attracted super fucking young audiences. Mm -hmm. And you knew that. And it was cool. It was fucking cool, man. You were a fucking rock star. These little fucking teenagers are like into your shit. Scooby Doo like, movie, man. You got that some 41. It just felt so fucking cool, man. It just felt cool. You felt cool. You didn't feel like, I want to go hit that shit. Like, are you fucking crazy? I, These are I think children. They're fucking children, dude. What's wrong with you? And when these fucking stories come out about these bands, I'm like, yo, dude, I like, what the fuck? You want to fucking send somebody some forward fucking text message on AIM? Okay. And and that person can be like, hey, I'm 14. Fuck. Like, you're <laughs> fucking drunk. Go to bed. Mm -hmm. The shit that happened at these shows is, it's fucked. Because for me, Pop Punk was so fucking cool and fun. And none of the bands I played with or played in. Like, it was never even, you never even, it wasn't, you weren't doing it to fucking hook up or whatever. You were doing it because it was like, you could, it's, it's an excuse to fucking go out. Go play a show in another town. Do something. Gotta get out of my town. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then like, when, when I got, like, started getting, you know, written up and whatever for this whole wave when I was, like, you know, making my first flash on fuck all this noise, you know, like, younger women be interview me and, like, talk to me and shit. And, like, we'd do our interview and whatever, and I'd be like, hey, what's your story? Like, where'd you come from? What'd you go through? And they'd all be talking about live journal. And they'd be like, this singer in this emo band totally fucking tried to fucking corner me. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, I can't, I can't possibly convince you or anyone who would ever hear this how different the world that I fucking came up in is from the early internet days. Those, those early 2000s mid 2000s when live journal and all this shit was taken off like it's just i just it, it's just like a thing it's like a thing of like feeling like shit you just it, feel like you believed music and you did music and you played music and you wrote about music and you did all this stuff and like yeah you heard about isaac brock and a couple of like this guy in your town this one guy there's this one guy there's these two guys like don't let fucking anybody go home with that fucking guy because you know that guy's a problem. Mm -hmm. Like it was observable. Mm -hmm. This guy is a problem. He has a problem. He has two beers and he's fucking crazy. And he's a fucking psycho. And I think this guy could cross the line. Like you knew it. You could fucking radar, man. 
and you fucking shut that motherfucker down and you did not let him come around. Not to make like, a uh, divide here, but do you think in, in the context of exposing the predatory actions of dudes from, you know, the 2000s, like brand new came out recently, which is something I always felt was going to happen. I don't know. I, again, I'm so scarred from this growing up with the predatory pop punk musician that they are all this guilty and brand new being guilty of uh, predatoring on a 16 year old. It was just like a, Oh, of course, of course, exactly. That's what's happening. And it's fucked for me because like the dudes who were playing pop punk in my day were old, you know? Yeah. They, were, they started their career at like 30. <laughs> Well, no, but you know, I'm talking like screeching weasel, no effects. All these yeah. fucking prop- propaganda yeah. was like psycho. You know, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say started the career, but they got big at 30 compared to being, you know, 22. But like, I see all these kids hating on Fat Rack as a macho thing, and I'm like, dude, they had fucking propaganda. They had fucking like Pansy Division was around. We were talking about this shit. We Pansy Division pro- is so fucking forgotten. As a big icon for that movement. Well, we were so fucking pro-gay, pro-everything. I didn't give a shit. I didn't fucking care. I just want to get laid, man. And if you weren't into fucking hetero shit, then fine. Yeah. I don't give a shit. I don't look down on you. I don't, you're, you're fucking gay? Good. Grad, man. I made out with dudes all the fucking time for fun, for fucking, like, have just fucking something to do. Like, just, like, you know, I don't, I don't even know how to explain this, man. Like parties you know fucking girls would be laughing fucking whatever some joke about you know heterosexuality homosexuality whatever you just make out with a dude just make out with him fuck it Mm -hmm. i don't give a shit man like i don't i'm not worried about it it's not like i'm trying to turn a girl on by doing that i'm just like here's where we are there's no fucking boundaries man that's what we that's why we're doing this man to find a place where there's no boundary and it doesn't mean like fucking orgies and shit, but it's just like demonstrate that like I am down with whatever the fuck you want. I'm down. Whatever you're here for. We're just having fun. And Pop Punk was like super social in that way. And it just got so fucking inverted when Green Day crossed over and 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 fucking yes. Pop Punk and Emo, Emo Mall fucking manic panic shit. And then oh. I talked to, you know, I did the two podcasts. MCR. I did two podcasts with Jeff from Thursday. Who? Like, what? You haven't heard those? No, I I, I do remember those, but I just can't remember them. <laughs> I remember they exist, but I don't remember. Well, we certainly didn't talk about this stuff, but it's just no. like you know, it's like you're flying a fucking flag, man. It's like I don't give a shit. I just don't care. I don't care. Like your boundaries, the things you're afraid of. I'm not afraid of them, and that's what we were all like trying to do. And then it just like you take three, five years off and you come back around and there are sexual predators who are fucking forcing themselves on 16 year old girls. And it's like, where the fuck am I? Like, it just sucked. It just, it was so fucked up. Not to wax philosophical too much, but it it feels like it was just the emo scene somehow caused a, when they melded together, it caused this weird shift of being about having fun and being in a rock band that could play three chords and be a huge rock sensation to being about this emotionally resonant thing with kids of that target audience. And you make a really good point because they're, they're, they're (laughs) flying the flag of, I represent your teen angst and you can trust me and I'm real. And I'm the guy at the mall. That's what I was about to say. I'm the guy at the mall. It's okay. You can feel safe. I'm the guy making the t-shirts you're buying. And then, you know, like, honestly, I got to say as much as to me, that was alien to my experience. They're totally fucking justified to mm-hmm. be like, you were straight up predators. You sold the inclusion of punk rock and emo to kids. Yeah. And then when they bought it, you totally fucking victimized them. It's fucked up, man. It just, it's so fucked. Cause I wasn't there for any of it. By the time that stuff started happening, you know, I'm down in New York and I'm making my push and I'm like, can I really make money at this shit? Can I do it? Can I like, can I fucking like wreck as a writer, as a personality? Can I fucking straight get famous? Like I met with the fucking editor in chief of entertainment weekly and I'm sitting down and, and we're talking and she's like, so what do you think's going on right now in music? And I'm, this is 2005, I think. 
And I said, the most important thing for you as an editor of a popular culture magazine is that you establish a relationship with Amy Winehouse. It is literally the only thing you need to do oh, fuck. because she is the most important musician in the last 20 years. Oh man. I and just, I'm Amy Winehouse could have been huge. Just the biggest thing in the world. I mean, she already was huge, but I mean like, yeah. So the editor, the editor goes to me, who? <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, um, and then, so then we started talking about like LCD sound system and my history of pitchfork and how fucking I know everything about music and blah blah blah. You're talking and, about uh, twelve rods gay. Yeah, twelve. Really? Oh, fuck off! No, <laughs> that's not dude. So I'm like, don't, don't put the fucking Chicago bullshit on me. That's Ryan and Bryn. I was in Boston, oh, man. I was that's Boston. the best ten was... out of ten review ever. No, Speaking of that, no, um, no, save Ferris. Save Ferris is the best ten out. That's true. Save Ferris. No, that was a nine point five. That was only nine point five. What's How it? the fuck I, do you know that? How I don't know. I, you know because that. I want to. Uh, that's oh, why I want to ask you. I want to ask you something. He, he went through Who a the... Safe Harris hole recently. Yeah, that's yeah, why. Yeah, yeah, I played with Safe Harris. Yeah, I don't know. Was... I don't know if you're so, aware, but wait, people have on, been archiving on. the deleted reviews. I opened in my. I really did this. I was in a pop punk band in college. Pop punk band called the Mysterians. We did one seven inch. Okay, but then in the window after that band broke up. I had some friends that I knew were fucking hardcore legit, loved the specials, loved Iggy Pop, and we had a ska band called the Escalators. <laughs> <laughs> and we opened, we opened at Skidmore College for Save Ferris, the Pie Tasters, and Mephiscopheles, bitch. Ooh. Fuck, what a lineup. Can you hear the fucking tumbleweeds running? As I know. I know. I can like, hear them. <laughs> this, was the, this was the death knell, the death knell of third wave ska. But anyway. Um, uh, just one more thing I needed to ask you about that. About the Who who the fuck is James P. Wisdom? James P. Wisdom? Yeah. So, <laughs> I don't want to get into this shit. So, uh, James, <laughs> he was around for a long time. So, look, we had pen names, okay? So, there were various points. God, I can't remember. There's a Japanese fake name. Oh, that's Ray I know Suzuki. Ray Suzuki. Ray Suzuki, yeah. I can't fucking believe you know that. You're such fucking dorks. Yeah. <laughs> Ray, so Ray Suzuki, Suzuki did the fucking the jet review. <laughs> Ray Suzuki was the Alan Smithy we agreed upon. Ray Suzuki was the Alan Smithy for any review. We would not put our name to. So we had. So when you talk about James P. Wisdom, you're talking about like the Sam Chenault period. Um, <laughs> so we had. I mean, dude, look straight up. We had like fucking six or seven people that were writing reviews that people were stoked on, man, because you couldn't get good reviews. What are you going to read a fucking spin Rolling Stone paragraph where it's like, this is a really appreciable step forward for this band. Like <laughs> Pitchfork, Pitchfork, we would go long on nothing. And that's why Pitchfork happened. We went long on nothing. And these fucking bands would be like, fuck. Someone wrote fucking nine paragraphs about my fucking record? Like, that's why it happened, man. It's why it all fucking took off. But yeah, James P. Wisdom was one of the earliest. There was also uh, Eric. Oh, fuck, what's his name? The original LL. So <laughs> the guy who started this didn't know anything about business. He didn't know what an LLC was. He didn't know what an S Corp was. And I was the only person with any fucking business acumen. I'm also the one who told him. I actually wrote the takedown note when uh, Steve Martin from... Uh, Beastie Boys PR company was like, I'm going to sue you because uh, Brent DiCrescenzo <laughs> wrote a review of Hello Nasty where he said some Brent. really dumb shit. Love Brent. Love those reviews. <laughs> God so, yeah, damn I wrote, it, Brent. I wrote, the re I wrote the retraction for that and Brent didn't know that I wrote it. He thought Ryan did. And I was like, Brent, look, bud. Um, I wrote that because you're fucked. You stated <laughs> facts that were you stated facts that were not true. And you're done. And I don't I don't think Ryan, like drinking diet Dr. Pepper, eating pizza and smoking weed in an apartment in Chicago, has the muscle to shut Steve Martin down. So you're fucked. You're gonna have to eat a big bag of shit. 
and we're taking it down, bud. But um, yeah, <laughs> the early players and the whole thing, you know, there's like there's like six, seven people, and then there was like two or three pen names and whatever. It's boring. Who gives a shit, man? Nobody cares about the stuff. It's fucking twenty years ago at this point. I mean, and not really, but it's you know, it's fifteen years ago. It's just. I don't know. I mean, I don't. I don't. The only the only people that bug me are the people who are like think it was worthy. Like, there's a bunch of people, like three or four people, who think it was like a really big deal, and like I'm a dick for trying to play with it, trying to fuck with it. My whole thing was like, fuck with this, like fuck with it. We were we were in a fucking we were at fucking CMJ in a subway car, and there were these like obvious indie like five girls and they were obviously indie people and we were like laughing and whatever and and i shattered across this train i was like yeah you guys read pitchfork and they were like yeah and i was like duh and they were like my boyfriend wants to my boyfriend wants to kick your ass because you wrote a mean review of piebald and i was oh, like really piebald. i was like are is he here because i'm not worried about it <laughs> And they started laughing. <laughs> they started laughing and whatever, and it was like a fucking joke. And then, like you know, we all got off the train. And they were like, "Dude, how did you do that? That was so punk rock. You're fucking crazy." And I'm like, "No, you're a fucking, you know, word I can't say right now because I'll get dragged for saying a p word. You know, whatever." <laughs> um, but I was just like, "Man, this is the thing. We got to fucking do this. We got to fucking ramp it up. We got to be obnoxious. We got to make ourselves personalities. We got to fucking." take the shit so far blah 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 and like everyone else was just like fucking it was like a cow in a field nobody got it like nobody understood the history of like fucking with shit and that's all i ever wanted to do and you know what man if i had my way we probably would have fucking flamed out and buzzfeed music would be all you're talking about mm. if, we, if it went the way <laughs> i wanted if it went the way i wanted to go it wouldn't have worked and i i accept that now but I, I don't think BuzzFeed is uh, that desperate to scrape the lack of uh, content and money that comes in for music coverage. They really yeah, jumped but, in on that, like, eating snacks and camera thing. Look, my, my whole attitude was, like, we have the whole thing by the ball. We own this dialogue. You guys don't believe it, but I know it's true. Like, yeah. I know it's fucking true. We can just piss in everyone's face. We own music dialogue. Let's protect that. Protect this house he attack but also and um it was just a thing of uh everyone else was like i need to make money and i yeah. was like well i make a fucking good living in my real job that's based on the skill like i have a skill that i do and that makes me money why don't we just like why don't you guys get real jobs and then we can fucking do this you know whatever man <laughs> it's boring as shit but like basically like i believed in it as a thing as a as a as an angle we had we were legit independent totally outside everything and we could have fucked everybody up because we were turning the corner of oh please give me free cds and please give me promo copies and please this to yeah. like you don't want to give me your copy i'll review it whenever i get it anyway fuck you like we were getting to the point of fuck you controlling the dialogue and fuck nobody you money nobody valued it it wasn't that we had money it was just we had control and nobody valued that control uh, in the way that i did and that's you know that's my own fucking insanity i guess mm -hmm. I, it's i think there's just a general aim to be more amicable public I, this is before you're called out for anything you ever did in the past thing i feel no, no, there was well, a general rise in that no of course because i made a joke about tranching you know you get tranched you know you get a 7.5 you're tranched there's nothing fucking nothing happening for your record if you get a 7.5. You are yeah. dead. Your record label is dead. Your fucking PR company is dead. You're done. And that was the thing when I was still there. Like before fucking advertisers and venture capital and private equity started juicing you know, money into this shit. I was like, you know what this means. If we give this this, if we give this this. Like if you don't give a record an 8.1 doesn't fucking exist. Yeah, like we're running the fucking show. We are literally controlling music dialogue, and like I said, we gotta protect this. We gotta fucking own this. Blah blah blah. And everyone's like, "Chris, you're fucking insane. You are a crazy person. You're literally fucking nuts." And 
it didn't help that I would get like fucking shit faced and you know call people at two in the morning and be like, bleh, bleh. I mean, I was like, <laughs> fuck, I was, I was totally fucking nuts because I thought I was sitting on the fucking. I literally thought I was sitting, and I was. I still believe I was sitting on a fucking crazy shift in, 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 in like dialogue around something that meant everything to me. But, uh, you know, I was the only one who had a good fucking job, honest to God. Everyone else was trying to get paid for it. Well, oh, oh. I, I gave you a good review. I should make a living off that. Are you fucking crazy? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you, dude? I worked in fucking media at that time. I worked for fucking Time Inc. I worked for people, teen people. Fucking, I, uh, that was my job. I saw it. I lived it. And I'm telling them all, this is over. Like, this, there's a thing coming. This is all over. Like, we can fucking own this next wave. And just everybody thought I was fucking crazy. One of my best friends is a... Uh, pretty big deal in uh in in fucking um tv and movies and shit <clears throat> he won an emmy actually who won for an emmy one of my best friends who was in my high school uh high school dinosaur junior type band uh he Ooh. he was the audio guy for 30 rock and he won an emmy uh, oh hey look at that yeah he's he did like uh he does huge shit like that catastrophe that catastrophically bad fucking show rise that just <laughs> failed that that was his that literally paid him a year's salary just to film that shit yeah, that show just... was so funny when, when he was telling me about the rushes for that show they would go in and they were like is there an lgbt character <laughs> and this, oh the, man the script writers were like we can we can make one of one of the kids trans I, is that yeah, we should do that. Yeah, God, I, I I've never felt more exploited as a as anyone member member in the LGBT community. It's it's absolutely the most pandering bullshit, and it's barely ever actually like genuine. So like, it's funny because like what you would may or may not know or think about me, like I have like a number of pissed off trans fans yeah. who are so fucking annoyed by how dumbed down and offensive all the dialogue around their struggle is like they're just like you listen to tons and tons of fucking like gay music and you talk about gay shit but like you're the most hetero cis dude ever and i'm like yeah i am but i'm like i talked to you about earlier i'm just like there's no like <laughs> like <laughs> just give everybody what they want man just it's there's nobody it's, <laughs> to there's go back on that big, it's just, Giving it's everybody just, what like, they want now just, is the big. They're pissed off at you qualities. for like impeding on their territory. They think you're impeding on their territory or something. No, 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 no. They're stoked about the fact that I'm like not trying to get territory. Like, uh, I, yeah. I'm not. I'm not trying to fucking win points. I'm not trying to fucking line my shit up with you. Like I don't give a fuck about what you want to do. I just think you should be able to. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like everyone acts like everyone doesn't want that or, or, or is blocking them. And I'm like, nah, it's not me, man. I don't give a shit. No, it's more easier than ever to be gay and famous these days. It's really well, is. no, it's it's <laughs> it's easy to be famous and anything. Yeah. It's still not easy to be gay if you live in fucking you know, the state. Well, I, I emphasize on the famous part, even though I said gay and famous, it is you can be if you're famous, you can be anything, yeah. Right, of course. But like, you know, the most like most of the fucking country is like you said, working warehouse jobs thirty eight grand a year and like their life sucks and then they gotta hear about this and they're like, you know, does this matter? I'm like, Well it only matters because the media is making it if they just fucking gave everybody what they're asking for, you gotta find real shit to talk about. And it just pisses me mm -hmm. off, man, you know, like Let's yeah. fucking talk about the fact that most of the country makes less than fucking 50 grand a year and inflation's gone up 2% every year for the last 10 years. And yeah. like half of that shit is on Obama's watch. Oh man, where's Casey? He would love this. Yeah, where's yeah, Casey's Casey going to love this content. Our our, right our poli sci major friend is uh is missing out very dearly. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the shit I like like, you know, I'm I, like look, Zero Hedge is a Russian propaganda wing like straight up it is 
but it's also important for you to read Zero Hedge if you want to understand the talking points that non-U.S. actors are trying to get you to fucking buy into. Like, oh yeah, I don't believe everything. in surrounding yourself by with your bubble of opinions. I don't believe you in better. That. You better fucking be reading Fox News every morning. I have. You know? We have it on the Twitter. It's on the feed. I read it all the time. I Absolutely. need to know. That's fucking genius, man. I mean, I'm glad there's people out there who get this because so many fucking kids don't get it. There's three worlds. There's fucking but, CNN, Fox, and like Zero Hedge or, or Info. Uh, yeah, stuff. Alex Jones. Uh, I When I say this, it's just America lives in a f- totally different reality from each other constantly at a constant that, state of overlap. So this was, my, this was my thesis in college. When the internet came out, I was in college and we had it early, crazy early. And um, I said, and my thesis was, this is going to return us to medieval ignorance because you're going to self-select all of your information sources and you're not going to know anything except what you bookmark. Now, take this back. I know this sounds fucking crazy, but take this back to medieval England. You only get the books that you have in your town, the world (laughs) that you know. The world that you know is what the town crier tells you is the world. And it's the same fucking thing. And it's just getting worse and worse and more and more like medieval, you know, ignorance. You know what people have access to in your community. That's it. So now your community becomes your folder of bookmarks. No different. It's completely fucked. Like you can have all the information in the world, but if you self-select this much information from these sources, you're as fucking dumb as people who thought that fucking, you know, the moon was fucking god or something i mean it's just fucking crazy how dumb people can get Mm -hmm. with all this shit out there you can be even dumber than you were in the 80s do you ever referential uh would you ever play metal gear solid 2 (laughs) snake snake yeah did you ever play the second one though with the whole speech basically entirely on this they had like a seven minute cut scene about just the freedom of information being a a death note to humanity yeah, and there, so so there's a great book called Republic 2.0, if you haven't read it, by a Chicago um, a law professor. And this is before there was – this is this was written in like 1999. Like all you had was eBay and a couple things. And this, this guy like – he just toned it all out. He's like, you're going to pick your folio of web pages and that's all you're going to know. And you're going to be so – fucking dumb <laughs> he's got a nice smug face he's made on the cover <laughs> well i mean this is this is ages ago i mean honestly, yeah, i know this, I, mean, no, I just wrote, i love i just love a good this, profile picture he wrote this before the dot-com boom he wrote this before there was any money behind the internet and he totally fucking saw it and it was basically like i wrote this childish you know thesis about this topic and then when i graduated like a year later this book comes out that's like okay there's a guy in his mid 30s you know i'm in my 20s there's a guy in his mid 30s who's fucking tuned this shit out like this is how it's going to go no matter how it ends up happening it's going to happen this way yep. and uh it just it fucks me up to this day i think about like i think about the shit that yeah it's it's fucking crazy it's yeah, the biggest you're, you're, effect i think the fake news boom of trump made it's well, the, it's he's the he's the he's the whole uh, Trump does the most basic thing you can do, which is lingu- linguistic, you know, yeah, uh, manipulation, which is, you know, you get a slick name like, you know, Lion Comey and blah, blah, blah. And you just keep shouting it. Yep. And then all these people are like, so, oh, great. I can hear your argument that it's worth listening to, like, all the sources of media out there. Um, what about the spin they put on everything, though? Uh, is is that a factor in your consideration there? Well, of course, because like what I was just about to say is trying to iteratively beat people over the head with jingoistic bullshit, like Lion Comey, Crooked Hillary, like Trump, his whole playbook, people simplify it and say that he's bullying. No, man. What he's doing is like age-old linguistic iterative domination. And, it, and like when he says these like catchphrases like Lion Comey, like when I see a phrase like Crooked Hillary, Lion Comey, uh, whatever, it's literally like seeing a swastika. 
it's there's no difference. It's search engine optimized speech. No, it's but it's not even SEO stuff. It's like this guy is trying to convince people in the simplest terms, two word phrases of a political bias that will get them to act. He invalidates something by making it a catchphrase. And that is the definition of all the history of um, dictatorial, uh, sociopathic uh, rage and hate based politics. And it's just, it, you know, whatever, man, this is way off fucking script. No, it is. It is off. It's, it ends up this way because of the climate. It really does. Yeah, sure. Because you get enough people who don't feel like they've been listened to. And history is yeah. going to, history is going to look back on Obama. Like dude, he's Jimmy you know, Carter too. No, Jimmy Carter was a fucking <laughs> nothing. Uh, you gotta understand like Obama came in there. He was a dick came in there with Rahm Emanuel. He was a fucking asshole. He told everybody in Washington, fucking basically suck my dick. I'm fucking rolling over you bitches. I got all the fucking votes I need. Fuck you. And most of the stuff Obama did, you know, was just fucking treading water. I don't yeah. have a problem. I don't have a problem with it. You know, that's what most presidents should do. Tread water. Don't fucking rock the boat. Um, it's fucked, man. It's fucked being like, you know, in my 40s, old enough to understand these people. Uh, <clears throat> Bush and Obama are a lot a lot more similar than a lot of kids would like to believe. Oh, uh, there's a lot of kids who are feeling that now. I see a lot of write-ups from younger people on these on these sites, and they do just sit there and go off on how they're so similar. How it's not, much you know, it's not deep state. It's not like there's a deep state. No. It's not, you know, it's just like they're they're trying to keep their job. They're trying to get paid. They're trying to hook their friends up. And in that respect, you know, he really was no different. I mean, whatever. This is. There's no answers, man. It's just, you know, it's fucking stupid. If, you, if you're going to fucking look at politics as a way to define yourself, you're already a loser. You yep. fucked it up. You define yourself by yourself, you know? It ain't about fucking hectoring bullshit, screaming and yelling about righteousness and fucking that. You're wrong. You're a bad person. I heard you did this one time. This is just fucking... The, the, the internet has amplified tawdry bullshit um in a way that just it just makes it impossible you can't move and and, it, and so to, to to get it back on the point of music like dude you can't move as you as a musician you can't move no nope. are you pre, are you pre-cleared to make music are you allowed to make music are you fucking kidding me Got your your old Rolodex full of phone numbers. Make sure not there, there's no phone numbers to somebody like him. Gotta yeah, make sure. You oh oh you posted some bad shit a while ago. You're you're invalid. Yeah. Okay, but you still listen to David Bowie. Yeah. <laughs> like all the all these fucking people throwing bricks at musicians and and whatever. They need to take a fucking hard look at their politics, because a vast majority of the music you enjoy was made by people who did really questionable shit. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it's just people have got to fucking. Was it the, to, to, the Gil Scott Heron? Uh, what God, what was it? There's that whole thing where he just goes on about faggots the whole time. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, the mm -hmm. subject of faggots. Or the, the subject, subject of, faggot. of faggots. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah go. Or, and, the, and or that track where he like uh, condones like the rape of white women oh, as like yeah. a form of reparations. Yeah. Yep. He's going to rebuild it from. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just, I, I look at this and I'm like, this is not where you need to go. Like the music, the music is not a product of those thoughts. The music is a product of creativity yeah. and it exists. It exists on its own. And like, I mean, we got to go there. R. Kelly. Oh yeah. No God. Did you see the Vince Staples interview at Coachella? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love Vince. He's a uh, he's not too far from being local for me. Uh, that this set me over the top in elation because I've been for a decade. <laughs> so I wrote a. Somebody asked me about this on Ask FM, and I was like, "How hard is it to turn off a song? It's not that hard to turn off a song. Mm -hmm. Tell me you turn off ignition. 
tell me you turn off ignition. Tell me you do that. <laughs> Every time you hear ignition, you turn it off. You don't fucking go for a beer. Tell me you don't go for a beer when you hear ignition. And if you can tell me that, if you can tell me you do that every time, fucking song. I can't say every time, and that's that's a fact. Like, I just, like, my DJ set, if you hire me to play in your fucking club and set the decks, first fucking song I play, smack my bitch up. First fucking song. <laughs> yeah. That is a fucking jam. I don't give a shit. It's a fucking great song. It is. No, it, it's I think the Prodigy have, have a chance to make a, a sweep around to the youth again because of just the the just, jamness can you of just, it. Can you just accept it as a fucking song? Can you just accept it as a song? Like Smack My Bitch Up, the people who made that song take that like you might as well be on fucking Sesame Street, man. These are fucking muso it's like the shaman. It's like Ebony's are good. It's nothing. You know? But you're gonna have a difficult time you know rationalizing r kelly fucking underage marriage jerry lee lewis marries his 13 year old cousin <laughs> I, it's just <laughs> didn't like four of his wives end up dead or something you know yeah sure oh, i was looking for the apple william s burroughs is really cool it's radical <laughs> man god he only murdered his wife that's cool oh but Lydia Lunch kurt is gonna cobain. go talk with him kurt cobain did a 10 inch with him man Lydia Lunch, she's there. She's talking about him. Uh, it's just, <laughs> look, man, creative people are fucked up. And I did this on the Ask FM. Yeah. All creative people, anyone who is creative, who wants to create and express themselves, has some level of narcissistic personality disorder. They are on the spectrum of narcissism or sociopathy. It's just not fucking normal. Kanye West is not a normal person. <laughs> I mean, I told the story before. When I worked at Time Inc., Kanye West was a nobody. He got a fucking interview, or literally, <laughs> to talk to the music director at People Magazine. And I was there because I knew her and we were, you know, tight and whatever. <clears throat> And the funny thing is, when Kanye was walking into the office, Ashley Simpson's dad was walking out with Ashley. Because <laughs> he was trying, he because this is before Saturday Night Live. She was a nobody. He was trying yeah. to pitch her. He was such a fucking creep. Oh my god. Yeah, no, anyway. he, I was at the conservatory where Jessica Simpson was brought up into fame. I it was uh yeah. the guy the guy who ran the place did not talk highly of half the people who he uh the parents of them and that's why he had a policy of never letting parents go anywhere near the audition room smart policy but anyway here's the genius of kanye west so i'm at pitchfork at this time kanye is nothing we haven't done we haven't reviewed him before any of that he walks in it gets past the you know door whatever and i look under his arm and he's got a connect four set <laughs> and I thought, I thought, that's fucking, that's fucking weird, dude. That's I brilliant, said, though. If I get I'm bored, like, I can play Connect Four. No, this gets even more fucking intense. <laughs> so I'm like, that's this is gimmick. It's fucking weird. Like, why didn't he just bring in a fucking like gold Zelda cartridge from an NES? I don't. It's fucking. I don't. I don't get it. This guy's fucking trying to he's trying a little hard i don't i don't know how this is gonna work for him man and i break off because i don't i'm not edit you know i didn't work in edit he goes in the room the music editor he starts talking to him glad handing hey nice to meet you hey you doing oh i got this shit going on and uh you know i just really i think there's time i think there's i think this is the time for a change in hip-hop i really feel like there's a time now you know, we've been through this stuff. You know, I think he mentioned Eminem. And he was mm -hmm. like, we've been through it. We've been through it. I think it's time for hip hop to really do this and do that and blah, blah, blah. And I, <clears throat> I broke off and I was doing whatever I was doing. I came back. He's got the Connect Four set up. When you play Connect Four, 
it's a kid's game. It's a children's game. It's like checkers. But when you set it up in front of you, you are staring at the other person for like the maximum amount of time you could conceivably talk to another person. And I saw him dropping checks and blacks into connect four with the music editor. And I just said, this is the greatest fucking genius I have ever seen in my life. Nobody ever got more time with a music editor than this motherfucker right here by setting up a children's game, disarming them completely and just staring at them one on one. He got so much face time. He That's left an impression. Brilliant. An impression you could never leave on anyone with a fucking board game. And I was like, he's God. <laughs> he is he's God. God. I mean, he's fucking God. You I mean, you I mean, like like look, man, future, all these people who've blown up and fucking been huge and great. And yeah, you made a fucking it would still be a great story, though. Despite it, Kanye never blew up. It'd still be one of the greatest stories you ever could tell. If just a man no, walks the in, point, with the this is the thing: is, is it was inevitable when you yeah. see someone do something that fucking genius. You're like, he's fucking nine levels above everybody. He was. I mean, when I, I just I remember at a forty five degree angle looking in on that office and seeing Kanye who like pitchfork we were already big upping him like college dropout had already gotten the ball this yeah. was like his audition with new york media and he's in the office with this woman and they're playing connect four and i was just like fucking like there's no instagram there's no twitter this is 2003 dude 2004 <laughs> i think there's yeah. nothing if college there's dropout no was out it was 04 yeah and there's nothing there's no game he's nothing he can work there's no oh i'm back on twitter i got fucking 10 million followers you know don't believe in yourself believe in your friends like whatever bullshit he's tweeting today <laughs> the anime tweets yeah whatever the fuck i don't give a shit when i saw <laughs> that i was like this motherfucker is an icbm he is gonna fucking destroy everything and the thing that was cool about it was watching him do it like you know n in paris and and all these fucking crushing fucking things he did and when yeezus came out like i was like i have these books i know exactly what books he's reading like mm -hmm. a history of the world and a thousand objects and like fucking like the 1917 encyclopedia britannica before they like you, you gotta be this crazy like I like I understood the level of his insanity, because <laughs> it, it is an intellectual insanity. It's not a racial insanity. No, yeah. And I was like, this fucking guy. He's never gonna like. I don't care if he makes three hundred million dollars. He's never gonna get rewarded or recognized for how fucking brilliant he is. It's always gonna get dumbed yeah. down. And I think that's what's driving. You think he still crazy. got it? He's always had it. What drives him it? crazy? What drives him crazy is that nobody how deep he's fucking got it. Mm -hmm. He's got it in a way that no other fucking <laughs> yeah. music I, celebrity has ever got it. If you think about it, what people so, took from Jesus was the Bound to parody video Seth Rogen which was the worst fucking song on the record. That's literally the he, shittiest he, song. Everyone said like I remember when it came out and I was in, it's Kanye making fun of Kanye. Absolutely. It's him making fun of what people want of Kanye. They want what, that stupid yeah. soul sample. They want it. I can't it. remember. What's the, uh, what's the fucking ninth or tenth track? There's a track that has a, like a reggaeton kind of guy. Oh, I, the guy with the random uh, the you, toasting in the middle of it? Yes, and that song should have been 25 minutes long. It was perfect. It's like a badass I have to, I haven't listened to Yeezus so, in so long. But I've gone What's back wrong? and I've listened What's to wrong with you. Because I'm listening to new things. I'm a young man. I'm keeping up. Waste of time, bro. <laughs> Waste of time. You can listen to anything else. Yes, yeah, send, send it up. Send it up. Yes, that's, that's the song. Yes. Oh, is it send it up? Yeah, yeah, that should have been 20 fucking minutes long. 
that should have been like as much as he got like all the fucking acid shit like yeah with daft punk on it and arca well the arca whatever but daft punk basically was like hey here's reality you want it like they had all the history and they gave it to him and he listened to it and he was like yeah 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 i don't know who could know if he was like down with early crazy fucking acid idm like early apex <laughs> you know I, it sucks to me that that daft punk you know granted him access to all that fucking 808 303 shit but mm-hmm. it doesn't matter because it may, it was so fresh to him that he dropped like the sickest fucking verses ever like, are you shitting me? The opening of that, I got it back in and put it in my inner mouth. Like, and he starts laughing. Like, he pissed in the face, and and it was before rap was even, like, it's before future, dude. It's before mm-hmm. all of this. It's before the whole fucking like FM radio, iHeart radio, like instamatic fucking million billion fucking shit. And we turn the corner this year, and it sucks because the black artists aren't getting it, and Lil Pump is. Mm-hmm. But like, oh, it was such a fucking weird gap, man. It just, I feel so gapped. Everything after fucking like early 2014 until now is just this fucked up, like beef, Drake, fucking Nego. Like, it's just, it got so fucking dumb. Like, the, it just the trap scene up. took over it, so fucking hard, and I've been. So- I've been just mediocre about it. It doesn't the trap scene just in general has been this blowing up of young thug and Migos and shit. And like, I've been mostly mediocre on it. And I'm a, I'm an avid hip hop follower since I literally, one of the first records I ever heard in full was green day, American idiot and college dropout. And I've just been following it, you know, the hip hop fucking zeitgeist ever since. So what do you think about like, what do you think about Kodak black's flow? Like this whole like, yeah. uh, 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 like I'm this flow is so fucking tired. And like when somebody asked me about Cardi B, I was like, okay, so now we have a woman doing. The... Uh, I, I do not know what happened. I just know. My connection dropped out for a second. Anyway, what I was saying was, what do you think of the insinuation that Fantano makes about Yeezus that MIA basically inspired the whole thing? Like Kanye three years would, earlier. Kanye wouldn't doubt that. Would Kanye relegate that MIA's Maya inspired Jesus? Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. I can't talk about MIA because you can't. Uh, Are you no, legally well, like... I mean, probably not if I don't want to get you know shouted down for for being, not liking uh, MIA. Sexist. <laughs> yeah, I've never liked her. I've always said she's uh, a totally rich kid, BS, nonsense person. Oh, she who, is, but you can't. Went to St. Martin's oh, no. College. <laughs> oh, I went to St. Martin's College. I don't Martin's think you should College. be afraid to air that opinion. Nah, you know. I think a I lot know, of it, No, it's it's cool. I'm I'm you know I I represent a this an underprivileged race, so I can, you know, it's it's all everyone's against me, even though I went to college <laughs> with Jarvis <laughs> Cocker. <laughs> God, Jarvis everyone's Cochran. against her even still, even though she's got the clout to... Well, Jarvis <laughs> handed her demo tape to... <laughs> it's a joke. Yeah. St. Martin's, man. That's how you do it, man. You go to St. Martin's, you're all good. You're going to be blurred. What was Bard College? Bard... What? She's from England, dude. What no, I know she's about? from England. I'm making a joke of the American equivalent. Sorry. Bad association. Uh, St. Martin's would be like... Uh... Yeah, Bard's not bad. Vassar, Bowden, you know, mm. all the good stuff. All right, so, um, yeah, guys. Uh, yeah, anytime, man. I mean, yeah. I love talking to you guys because you guys are, like, super... Weird. No, you're just dorks. You're just yeah, dorks. We're I don't dorks. care about we you like to bring up like, old pitchfork. Keep, keep this in mind uh, with the old pitchfork like reviews. <laughs> the pitchfork reviews were just read by us, like, two years ago compared to 20 years ago. <laughs> Uh, you got Why you got a house on my age, man? Why you got a house on how old? I'm not. Got, I'm not flexing the the youth here. I'm just saying, keep that in your brain. That is now, old man. 